Section 1. War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Dr. Robert Marshall Allen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dr. Beth Thomas. Dedicated to the cause of freedom and a lasting peace. To all who have joined the deathless army. To those who have blazed the trail and made it easier to follow. Section 1. Aldershot. The writer volunteered on the outbreak of war and entered Aldershot on the 11th of September, 1914. 9th Battalion, King's Royal Rifle Corps. Things have changed since I last wrote. The call only allowed me 48 hours. However, I had my things handy, and packing did not take long. At present all the regulars have left, but there are 100,000 of Kitchener's army training. The country is very sandy and covered with heath, and not specially interesting. Aldershot itself is a wilderness of barracks and parade grounds. I reported at headquarters and was soon fixed up. I was then sent to report at two hospitals. Here again all the men were very kind, though obviously working under high pressure and understaffed. It was a trial going down the streets with so many Tommies saluting, but by now I'm quite used to it, and the return salute is mechanical. After dinner I set out for Blackdown, six miles from Aldershot. I arrived at 10pm in pitch darkness, but had a warm welcome from the officer's mess. I had no blankets with me, but the colonel lent me an overcoat and several rugs. Next day I reported at the detention hospital and began my duties. This is a training centre for infantry and artillery. We form part of the next division to go abroad, the 1st Division of Kitchener's Army. They should be ready early in January, but long before that I hope to be shifted on nearer the front. I have charge of 2,500 men, and the married quarters in addition. Everything is in a chaotic condition, and it could not well be otherwise. They get as many recruits in a day as in a year previously, and with most of the regulars away, it makes things harder for those left behind. As red tape is not altogether absent, delays are still common. My day begins at 9 a.m., when I hold my morning sick parade. This averages 80 to 100 per day. I enter them up in triplicate, and, as so far, I have no drugs here, they all go to the detention hospital ten minutes off. Then I go to the latter and pull teeth if required. I am an expert at that now, though the first victim may not think so. In addition, I make up the stock bottles for the whole camp, 7,000 men. This takes me well on to 1 p.m., lunch and a smoke, and at two I have another sick parade, but this is light. My room is primitive, just a non-commissioned officer's bunk cleared out. My orderly is a lance corporal. He is willing and is quickly learning to spell medical names. Diarrhea worried him for a long time. After this parade, I do my sanitary rounds. I go through all the barracks and tents and urinals and look for defects, and infractions of orders. Then a lays to 6pm, when another sick parade is due. My work is now over. It is largely routine, and there is some clerical work, particularly in the discharge of unfit men. On the whole, the men are a very fine lot, keen as mustard and learning quickly, but there are some awful crocks. How they were medically passed beats me, and my present job is to weed them out. The war office objected up till this week to wholesale discharging of men, but now they have got so many good men coming forward, they have allowed us a freer hand, and we can, on our own responsibility, discharge anyone. This battalion is a mixture of good men and rotters. I have the biggest sick parade in the district, and here is my astounding bag up to date. One lunatic, two idiots, five epileptics, a case of locomotor ataxy, a man paralysed down one side, many tubercular cases, flat feet, hernia and varicose veins galore, and a big lot of defective vision cases. So far I have got rid of 40, and will soon have all the incapables out. Sore feet worry a lot and I hope soon to give a few practical hints between parades to each company in turn. After my walking tours, I know a wrinkle or two. Most of the men arrive with only what they are standing in. The weather has been cold and wet recently, and as they are out all day drilling, there has been a plentiful crop of colds and bronchitis. Friends are sending shirts, socks, etc., and soon each man should have a change. This is no joke for them. Many hours are spent in drill, but the majority are keen, and there are few slackers. The men are a mixed lot, well-to-do and poor. The best company consists of a big batch of men who arrive together from Nottingham. My room is in a long bungalow. 
My servant was picked for me from one of the companies. He is an ex-valet, so I have a good man. Such luxuries as having your clothes laid out are new to me, and will spoil me for the future. Nearby is a German prisoner's camp. The doctor in charge is an old pupil of mine, and we have many a chat. Aldershot, 23rd September, 1914 We were shifted on here two days ago. On Monday I marched in at the head of the rear guard, and right proud I felt. Last week I asked Colonel if he would mind me talking to the men on some medical topics. He was delighted and gave me every facility. So I began on the care of the feet, a subject I know a good deal about, practically. I addressed the men in batches of three hundred, between parades, in the open air. The Colonel and Major were at the opening lecture, and said it was just what they wanted. Later on, the General came up and congratulated me. I felt proud of the praise he gave, and now the Colonel is at me for more lectures. My former experience helps me a lot, but I have yet to get experience with big audiences, and I don't know how to spare my voice. Open-air speaking is hard, and my throat feels tired after it. The men apparently got some good tips. I purposely made my remarks short, practical, and to the point. This addressing of the troops by the doctor is new here. Most of the men in charge of regiments are young graduates with no experience in speaking, so they naturally don't do it. The weeding out process has been going on relentlessly. I have now a bag of 120, and have got rid of nearly all the crocs. Blackdown was on a high moorland, bleak and cold. Now we are between Aldershot and Farnborough, where the headquarters of the Flying Corps are. Biplanes whiz over us all day long, and one came a cropper yesterday, quite near us. The quarters are much better, and we have a fine mess. My work has now greatly increased. I get up at 6am, and have my sick parade at 7am, dole out the medicine, pull teeth and do minor work, and then breakfast. Next I go to my headquarters at the Connaught Hospital, and report to the Colonel in charge, and get any orders from him. Sanitary rounds and more parades finish the normal day. This still left plenty of time, but that is now past, for I have to vaccinate and also inoculate for typhoid the whole battalion of 1,200 men. I have to see every arm and enter in a book the details of previous vaccinations, the number of vesicles, etc., and decide whether to do it again. This, as you can imagine, is no easy job. Typhoid vaccination is voluntary, but one tries to get all the men done. Once more I was called on to lecture. I spoke to the men explaining in simple language what immunity meant, what typhoid or enteric was, and why we inoculate, giving the figures obtained in India and South Africa. I explained that while their instructors were perfecting them in military duties, we doctors had a very important duty to strengthen their bodily defences against unseen minute foes. I pointed out that typhoid especially attacks young fellows and ended up by hoping they would all be inoculated, and thus leave no stone unturned to make themselves fit in every way. The Colonel also spoke, and I did forty men tonight. But if they react strongly, I am afraid there will be a lot of shirkers. I am doing the donkey work at present. It is important, and I am putting all my energies into it. My Colonel has taken a liking to me, and we have a long chat every day, and I hope that after a time I may get away to the front. At the worst, I shall go on with the regiment. Our officers are a fine lot, young fellows, many of them home on leave from India. We have great times of an evening, yarning and poking fun at each other. They help one in every way they can, and I often get hints about army etiquette, about which I am naturally ignorant. There are a 110,000 recruits here, and the place simply resounds with drill instructors hard at it. The men are rapidly coming on. It is fine to watch them marching, singing away merrily. The whole of the Scottish recruits are here, and you should hear them singing I Love a Lassie. The real accent was there. I believe the King may review us on Saturday, and Kitchener is going to disturb our Sunday rest with a big review on Laffin's Plain near here. 1st of October, 1914 I seem to have been all my life in the army. The rotunda is a far-off dream. From early morning to sunset one hears nothing but the singing and whistling. I am now engaged in the big task of revaccinating most of the men, and inoculating all of them against enteric. It is wearisome to stand as I did yesterday for four and a half hours, and just scratch arms, until I had done two hundred vaccinations. The inoculations are easier. I do a hundred a day. We are all in bed at 9.45 p.m., tired out. One odd job I got last week was very interesting. I was ordered to look after the transport of 150 wounded from the station to the hospital. A few general instructions were all I got, then I was left alone to do it. By this time, I am used to just doing things and making my own precedents, and it is good for one too. 
you should have seen me swanking up and down the platform giving orders galore these men were a batch of one hundred and fifty part of the one thousand two hundred who had been laid out at the n the hospital train consisted of corridor carriages with all the fittings taken out along the sides of the empty coaches were beds and others were suspended above them everything was painted white there was a good kitchen and bunks for the doctor and his staff these trains looked very fine indeed my transport consisted of motor cars and buses i had a squad of ramc orderlies and they carried the wounded to the wagons most of the men were severely wounded but they were all very cheery they all wanted cigarettes after all was finished the chief pointed out one or two defects and thanked me i felt pleased at the success of my first responsible job next day i went to see the men and got my first view of shrapnel wounds modern artillery certainly makes a mess of poor humanity the entrance wound is small but the exit is a jagged area four or five times as big and with appearances as if an explosion had occurred there were some curious wounds one man was hit in the cheek a tooth knocked out and the bullet landed in his tongue it was not discovered for some days because of the swelling another man was hit by a piece of bomb thrown from an aeroplane he got a small wound on the buttocks and was paralyzed from the waist downwards two cases required amputations they arrived in a terrible condition the dressings not having been touched for days it was interesting to listen to their accounts of the fighting there is universal belief in the efficiency of the german artillery but our tommies have a supreme contempt for the infantry the terrible losses of the past few weeks are beginning to tell on the germans the infantry advance in close formation and fire a volley from the hip when about one hundred yards off then our boys begin to charge with rosalie and the sight of cold steel is too much for the huns who turn and run every man told the same tale on the whole our wounded are being well treated one soldier had been wounded and captured by the germans and propped up with german wounded by a hayrick the fighting got more vigorous and their guard ran away leaving them all free the french are fighting very well and they take no prisoners i believe the turcos are the limit they kill wounded as well many of our officers who have been in gurkha regiments say the gurkha don't know what the white flag means apparently all sides are disregarding the white flag for there have been many instances of german treachery regarding its use last saturday the king reviewed the battalion stationed here it was a brilliant day and the boys did look well they had been training very hard and all were keen to see the king he was accompanied by the queen princess mary and kitchener they walked along the front line and then got into motors and drove off the boys were very disappointed for most of them only saw the queen's parasol while the king certainly had a lot to do we had hoped that he would have ridden down all the ranks the men have worked hard they wanted to see their king and all the majority got was two hours on the parade ground kitchener was in good form the war office is no sinecure and nobody else would have got so much done in the time yesterday i had a busy time making up monthly returns which seemed to be devised to torment unfortunate regimental doctors they are bad enough in peace but with all things upside down they are much worse it was harder also when one had no previous experience but i managed to get mine pretty accurate i may get away before the troops but i am not too sanguine i rather expect that they will keep me here i am now up to all the duties i shall soon ask if i can go on while this panel practice is pleasant i want to be doing more exciting and interesting work i am glad that i was not attached to a hospital here the regimental life is much more interesting. 8th of October, 1914. I am slowly getting the inoculations done. This battalion is by no means the best in the camp. I have discharged more unfit and have a bigger sick parade each day than the other men. There are also more men refusing inoculation than one would like. I am getting rather tired of persuading them. The Anti-Vivisection and Vaccination Society have been distributing leaflets to the men with alarming statements regarding the bad effects of it. If we could catch the ruffian who is doing it, we would make it hot for him. I explained things to the men, and many were then done. The objectors are largely old soldiers, also young fellows who are funked by the yarns the former tell them, and others who object to any preventative schemes. Some of my constant attenders at sick parade were among them this week i had an additional job getting lousy men clean the hospital refused to treat them or to give me sulphur so i just got them all stripped and put them in a bath with carbolic in it meanwhile i got their clothes in the oven and turned on the steam at about a hundred pounds pressure 
This soon did for the little beggars, then into the baking oven to dry. The blankets and mattresses were fumigated with sulphur. By these means I eradicated a nasty disease. If any man now turns up infected, he will be punished. Yesterday an RAMC major inspected what we had done. He also asked if we wanted to stay with the regiment or go on soon to the front. I chose the latter, and I shall make a personal application tomorrow. It would be pleasant to stay here with the men, and go on in the spring under good weather conditions. Winter will soon set in, and I may go to some forsaken spot in France and be under very hard conditions. But I feel I should go, and I want to. My French and German should be of great use to me. Probably this may be the last long letter from me for some time. One never knows. The end of battle is still dragging on. Some of our senior officers are rather pessimistic about the result. I believe the centre trenches are only one hundred yards apart, and the men on both sides are dead beat. Southampton, 9th of October, 1914 Just a few lines before we go aboard. I had only two hours' notice yesterday. There was a terrible bustle. The officers in my mess were kind enough to say how sorry they were to lose me. When I left, the colonel did me the honour of asking all to give me three cheers. I appreciated it very much, and I know what their kindness did to me, and how it helped me in my work. Then down to the station, no bands, no cheering crowds, just on to the train and off. I am not going light-hearted, nor am I funked, but this continental trip is something different from any of my others. It will be no picnic. I shall probably have a tremendous amount to do, but I feel that I shall be able to do it. As a grim reminder, I have my identification disc around my neck. Our little party promises good. Two of the men are Irish, and the others are Canadian, an Englishman, and an Australian. So we represent the Empire pretty well. End of section one. Section two of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2. Bologna. 15th of October, 1914. We stayed a couple of days on the French coast waiting orders, and got a further insight into war conditions. Would that those at home could see them, then they would wake up. Here we got our baptism of fire. Away in the distance we heard guns. An aeroplane, a taube, sailed over us, and as we watched it three loud explosions were heard, and black smoke rose in columns. The nearest bomb landed about two hundred yards from us. One hit an engine and blew out the side, another made a hole in a garden, and a third landed in water. Soon guns were going off, and one of our aviators started in pursuit, but the taube got away. Another one was shot down. The most interesting part of the voyage has been what we saw of military and naval precautions and movements. Naturally we must say nothing about these. I think we will settle down and form a very happy mess. We have a fine man in charge. Each of us is put in charge of something. I am the interpreter for the party, and I am attached to our chief to help him in general work. I shall probably lend a hand to anybody when there is a rush on. The other day I was sent to interview the commandant, and I saw a bit behind the scenes. We have had a good reception from the people. They do all they can for one, and often give things for which they will not accept payment. When we landed, tea, cigarettes, and chocolates were given free to the men. 5th of November, 1914. I am sorry there's been such a delay since the last letter, but I have been so hard at it that I could not write. Now there is a lull at the front, and I am freer. We stayed four days in camp, and spent the time drilling and looking out for a site. Eventually we got a fine hotel on the coast. The position is superb, and on a clear day we can see the white cliffs of England. Though not far from the front, we still seem near home. The day we arrived was strenuous, up at 5 a.m. and marched here. Then the hotel had to be cleared out and fitted up. At first I was in charge of unloading at the station. When that was finished, I got to work shifting furniture. At midnight we were all dead beat and rested till the morning. We then finished off and the carloads of wounded men soon came in. The major appointed me chief surgeon and made me responsible for all surgical work. Three of us did the major operations, and we were soon busy. I cannot give you details of numbers, but we were soon doing double our supposed number. We began without nurses, but had to apply for them. It was no joke acting as sister as well as surgeon. Our arrival coincided with the commencement of the big fight for Calais, now going in our favour. With the increasing work, we began to be more a general hospital than a stationary, 
and certain changes were inevitable. A general hospital has 500 beds, and a stationary one 200. The big hospitals must have at least one fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons on the staff. As we had none, we were soon sent one, and I then worked under him. There are also consulting surgeons appointed to supervise all the hospitals. These are big men from London with the rank of colonel. The writer here mentions a very pleasing experience he had with one of these big men, and then goes on, I am doing my best, working nearly eighteen hours a day at full speed. I have not been outside for over twelve days. This is no picnic, but I am in fine fettle. It does help one to know his superiors are with him, and appreciate his efforts. Everything is new, the wounds quite different and terrible. But above all towers the cheery stoicism of the Tommies. They never complain. I have had chances of speaking German to the wounded, and it cheered them up to get someone who could talk fluently to them. 9th of November, 1914. If I get moved to the firing line, I shall let you know by cable. This, however, is unlikely, as my chief won't let me go. It is gratifying to know one is of some use. He has also done me the honour of allowing my letters to pass uncensored. I should like to write freely, but I must not. Yesterday we got an RAMC man from the front. They have a pretty rough time of it, little better than the troops as regards danger. The Germans shell every main road, dropping shells at intervals all along it. They want to dislocate the transport service, and naturally the ambulance wagons come in for a share also. No wounded can be shifted from the trenches in the daytime. At night the doctors go up, and often are fired on. Our artillery has been doing grand work recently. There are a couple of armoured trains with 9.2 naval guns aboard. One of these put three Jack Johnsons out of action in seven shots at a range of seven miles. We have just got news of the sinking of the Emden, and naturally I feel very proud that the Australian Navy was in at the death. Things are slowly progressing, and those in the know seem to be optimistic. Now for a description of our daily life. I believe that folks at home have had all sorts of tales about the poor treatment, and even worse, of our sick. As far as I have seen, that is all bunkum. The British RAMC is really marvellously organised. The war is an abnormal one, so there will be mistakes made. But taking all in all, our arrangements are as perfect as possible, and infinitely better than the French. When a man is wounded in the trenches, he lies there all day. His regimental doctor gives him first aid if he is there on the spot, otherwise at night. Parties then come up from the clearing hospital and remove the cases. These hospitals renew dressings if necessary, and classify all the men. Only very urgent cases are operated on by them. Then the wounded leave by motor transport to the nearest station, or are put straight on the hospital trains. These are staffed by doctors and nurses, and run to Boulogne. Here the wounded are distributed to the various general and stationary hospitals. Considering the fierce fighting and the constant shelling of main roads, it is a wonder the wounded ever get here. I must say, the men at the front do their work exceedingly well. When they arrive here, we classify them further, put them to bed and give them a hot drink. Then any dressings are renewed. We see the extent of the injury. We only keep serious cases on here. The others are marked, cot, berth, or sitting up for home, or convalescent camp if they are fit to return within three weeks. My wards are in a restaurant of the hotel, and have plenty of windows. High tide is only a few feet off, and the view is superb. We have the best sisters, and we pride ourselves on our wards. Our hospital has a great reputation, and we are trying to live up to it. The Major is a splendid organiser, always hard at it and never sparing himself. He inspires us. Recently we got a lot of Canadian nurses, who were waiting for the Canadians to come over. They are dressed in military uniform, and wear badges of rank. They quite put ours in the shade. They are very capable. 11th of November, 1914 the work here is something quite new and strange to all the medical staff. The wounds are terrible. A clean bullet wound is all right and heals quickly, but shrapnel makes a terrible mess. Then we have lockjaw, or tetanus, ever ready to give the unfortunate a most painful end. The great ally we have here is the sea air. It simply works wonders. Apart from actual work, I find that my German is of great use. A few words with the German wounded cheers them up. They like to speak to anyone who understands them. I have just been talking to a Landwehr, or reserve man of forty. He was only four days at the front, but he saw enough. He told me that Germany is fast coming to the end of her men. He also stated that the young men run off at the sound and results of the heavy firing. Behind them are stationed troops who shot them. He had seen these sights frequently. 
all the germans we have had have been very decent and they were profoundly grateful for the attention they got our soldiers did what they could for them there is no animosity between the wounded one man though badly hurt in one arm goes round all the beds helping others they are eager to do anything a few days ago i had an amusing yarn with two connaught rangers they spoke in the soft irish of the west and of course i pass as an irishman always one day a pig wandered in front of the trenches and the irish feelings were aroused what a fine fellow he was wouldn't he go well with a few heads of cabbage he didn't wander about much longer another night two men strayed out of the trenches and began to milk a cow they were seen dimly and fired on as germans luckily they escaped but the cow was killed next morning the same lads got out and secured a good stake i think the worst cases we see are those due to severe mental shock cases of fathers who have seen their sons killed or brothers or in some instances being the only man alive in a trench after a shell has burst their condition is really pitiable this war will leave lasting impressions men do not forget in a hurry the piles of german dead or their own i do not want to be lugubrious but one sees the awful reality here personally i am very fit the sea air agrees with me also plenty of work 18th of november 1914 i have not had so much to do lately and my cases which were serious are getting on well so when the major said to-night that i was to get thirty-six more beds i felt rather pleased i am at it all day long with only a walk on the beach to brace up the way we are fed is one of our triumphs it is most instructive to see the huge stores at our base in boulogne and the way they are handled the troops feed on the best of everything magnificent bacon and cheese jam galore and bread better than any i have ever tasted in the hospital we get fresh milk eggs and chickens from folkestone those in the firing line are equally well looked after the lorries run up every night as far as they dare and transfer stores to those waiting everything seems to go by clockwork the government have seen the benefit of feeding up the troops there is an enormous quantity of jam consumed tommy has a sweet tooth and gets the best fifth of december nineteen fourteen our forces are resting and not in the trenches just now we only get medical cases and this means a reduction in our surgical staff i am again trying to get to the firing line the weather has been extremely bad high gales with rain hail and cold twelfth of december nineteen fourteen i think of you all enjoying the sun here we have a bleak landscape with bare trees the sky cloudy and a piercing wind blowing occasionally a very watery sun tries for a few minutes to break through the roads are quagmires and walking is not a treat you can imagine what it is like in the trenches i have now got rid of all my fracture cases when they went aboard ship the p m o came out and said he was extremely pleased with the way we had fixed them up so once more our hospital takes a high place the war office also gave us a pat on the back i had a german prisoner who was wounded he wrote home to his people and his father sent a letter to the war office thanking them for the kindness shown he also asked them to convey his thanks to us the letter was a very fine one and the war office was pleased to get such evidence from the enemy i wish they would publish it just to refute a few of the wireless lies sent all over the world all the wounded are treated alike irrespective of nationality and they share all the extras before he left this same boy gave me a shoulder strap with his regimental number as a gift twenty seventh of december nineteen fourteen i am still waiting for my call christmas weather was splendid bright sun and clear sky we had no elaborate celebrations but each ward was decorated and we gave our patients a stocking full of odds and ends we each got gifts from the royal family the king and queen sent a card with their photos and a message the gift of princess mary was a handsome brass box containing a pipe tobacco and cigarettes the lid had her profile nineteen fourteen and the names of the allies on christmas day we got a piano up two stories and had a sing-song of five hours the men joined in willingly and some of them were very good the weather has again broken cold and incessant rain third of january nineteen fifteen still at boulogne and very quiet the opposing forces are playing a stalemate and with the present awful weather conditions are likely to do so for some time we are getting practically only medical cases rheumatism and allied troubles eighth of january nineteen fifteen the call has come and i am leaving at midnight with my kit a day's rations and water bottle full for an unknown destination 
I have to report to the ADMS Lahore Division, consisting of British troops from India. 14th of January, 1915. I am now in a field ambulance, and my ambition is gratified. Leaving at midnight, I reached my destination in the morning. I then changed into a motor transport, and was soon rushing along those straight roads of France. Troops of all kinds passed us, Lancers, Sikhs, Gurkhas, and British. It was with difficulty I reached the chateau and reported. The ambulance is resting in a small mining village, resembling Lanarkshire in dreariness and slag heaps. It is raining, and one walks about in mud ankle-deep. All the senior officers are from India. Our stretcher-bearers are Indians, and the senior warrant officers are Eurasians. Yesterday I was on a court-martial. Three languages were used, English, French, and Hindustani. It was a wearisome case, but it showed me how careful they are in the army. Tomorrow we leave for a new post and begin work. I hope to add Hindustani to my other languages. End of section 2《Section 3 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3. The RAMC at Work. 20th of January, 1915. Since last writing, I have been right into it. My letters from now on will have to be more discreet than ever, but I have my diary, and that holds everything. Five days ago we made a trek of fifteen miles to our present base the roads were vile and we got bespattered with mud these roads are paved with sets in the middle and the sides are left alone woe betide any transport which gets to one side one of our carts did so and sank up to the axle immediately the country is absolutely flat with clumps of wood and tall poplars lining the roads it is waterlogged and water lies over many fields in fact many roads are under it also with all the transport going on especially motors you can imagine what a time we have on foot we passed through several villages which had been shelled an interruption of two days has been caused by the boches shelling my dressing station and i had to clear out yesterday luckily i had no casualties all along the road we saw the reserve trenches half full of water there were also graves of soldiers of various nationalities each with a plain cross and often a cap hanging on it finally we reached our billets in a brewery this village had been shelled by us and the church destroyed in driving out the germans the tower was still standing but the roof was gone and the stained windows all shattered nearby was a four point seven gun which made a terrific noise when it went off the following day i was sent by myself with one section to open an advanced dressing station in a village about one and a half miles behind the trenches it had been vigorously shelled several times and was in a very dilapidated condition houses were roofless cut in two or with one end blown off but it was curious how many were spared and others destroyed my first post was in a fine house in rather an exposed position we had funk holes or dugouts behind for emergency use at night we had to block up all windows in order to prevent our lights from being seen my job was to go out at night to the regimental aid post and remove the wounded an aid post is where the regimental doctor is and to where his stretcher bearers bring the wounded from the trenches it is supposed to be out of the range of fire if possible mine wasn't all the country here is very flat with practically no cover i took my wagons up as far as i could and then left them in a safe spot we had then to skirt a big quadrilateral at one corner a sniper was reported to have his gun trained but he hasn't got us up to date we then had a run of about four hundred yards dead in the open and this was dangerous the trenches were only a hundred yards in front of the aid post they tended to converge at an angle and i got the fire from both sides bullets whizzed over in great style and at first i ducked every one matters were not improved by the searchlight which winked at us frequently magnesium lights are used these are fired from a pistol and give a very brilliant light, lasting about twenty seconds, lighting up the country for miles. When a light goes up, we crouch down so as not to give the sniper too obvious a target. On the second night, both sides began to shell when I was on that road. A big shell is a fearsome thing. It makes a terrific roar as it goes past, and one always thinks it is coming straight for him. Two days ago I went down by daylight to the aid post on business and had a narrow escape just as i got in the door a shrapnel shell burst where i had been standing you may believe it gave me the jumps they then hit the house and shelled the road systematically 
my progress back was also hastened by more shrapnel. Bursting shrapnel gives a good scenic impression, and it leaves a fine, fleecy cloud. Yesterday morning, as I was attending to some sick men, a shell burst outside my door and made a hole in the footpath. Then another landed on the roof, and this decided me to clear out. I galloped into headquarters for instructions, and returned and got all my sick away in safety. The Germans sent a lot of shrapnel into the town that day, and most of it fell round my place. Being shelled out is not a comfortable experience. I had to leave my first place because it was wanted to make a fort. All round the town were batteries, and where I went to was a bad spot, next the church, but it was all I could get. As already mentioned, I soon got shifted out of that, and now I am in another village, also next to church. We have had a choice selection of weather lately, snow and rain, but today is fine and freezing hard. The roads I go down are all under water, about six inches deep. When you are not in water, you squelch through mud. I have not had my clothes off for a week. My boots are a sight. I sleep on stone floors in any old spot, and am quite fit. The shells certainly make one sit up, and I have a wholesome respect for them. Up to date, no Jack Johnsons have come my way, but one never knows. 28th of January, 1915 after getting out of that old village where I had been shelled, I went to another one about two miles away. Nothing happened there, but on my last night out collecting I had a narrow shave. It was moonlight, and I was returning from the aid post with my wounded. As usual, I was in front, as we always go, and no firing was going on. Suddenly a shot rang out, and the bullet hit the ground beside me. A cowardly sniper was at work, knowing full well that an RAMC officer was leading. He could see who we were, and it made me very angry. I wouldn't have minded so much if I could have hit back, but it is all in the game, and one can only be thankful they were not winged. I had a strenuous week, and was not sorry when we came back to our old quarters for a rest. I saw all I wanted to, and got some sensation thrown in. Once we begin to move forward, it will be quite different. At present I have a fixed spot to evacuate the wounded. Later on it will be several places. The trenches simply zigzag across level fields. They don't form a straight line, but are always irregular. Behind these again are the reserve trenches, and about 15 yards in front are the barbed wire entanglements. Everywhere are telephone wires attached to trees or stakes or lying on the ground. Batteries are in farmhouses, about three or four miles from the trenches. They are shielded by various methods from the aeroplanes. I began in wet weather, then it snowed, and finally we got a dry spell. Immediately up went the aeroplanes on both sides. The prettiest sight I have yet seen was one of our anti-aircraft guns firing shrapnel at a tauber. You could see the white puff and then hear the bang. They fired twenty-two shots at that one and never got it. The tauber sailed serenely on with bursting shrapnel on all sides. These aeroplanes are the very devil, for smoke bombs were dropped and soon the shells came over. I am glad to be able to tell you that the guns which shelled me out of were silenced that day by our men. The observer lies hidden with a telephone near the trenches and observes the hit. At night one sees fixed lights in cottages. These give the directions for our guns if they have to fire. In one village where I was, there was also Little Willie, a 4.7 gun. When Little Willie went off, so did the tiles of the houses. The glass panes had gone long ago. When a six-inch fires, you feel a concussion at least a mile off. After coming back, one missed the constant crack of rifles and the rat-a-tat of the maxims. Heavy gunfire doesn't disturb me in the least. It is curious how quickly one becomes accustomed to roughing it. I slept all that week on stone or wooden floors. I found my boots made a good pillow. A bed was a luxury I never saw. The windows had no glass, and I ate what I could get by candlelight. I did not do at all badly on my rations and a few extras. One's feelings when going into fire for the first time are mixed. I was frightened, of course, but just kept straight on. If I had been alone, I probably would have run, but I was leading Indians and I couldn't show any hesitation. I will certainly take care of my fellows, and no matter what comes, I shall lead and not do the German method. On one night, only just before an attack, I was undecided whether I would go down a certain road. That feeling soon wore off, and I went along heedless of the bullets, but I have not yet had enough shells to enable me to laugh at them. Opposite to where I was were Saxon troops. One must admire the way in which the Germans looked after their trenches. They boarded the floors and had engines to pump the water out. In my line of trenches the water was three feet deep. You can imagine what it must be like in this climate. 
The men came out slime up to their necks. Most men smear Vaseline over themselves before dressing, but the water gets through. Conditions have changed considerably since the first months. Then we had no reserves, and the men had to stay weeks in the trenches without relief. Now there is a very good scheme of short spells of work and then rest. That is why we are now out of the firing line. At present I am in charge of the baths, and have to bathe and disinfect the whole brigade. It is all day long in an atmosphere of vermin and steam. But I am enjoying variety. 3rd of February, 1915 The week has been quiet, and we are resting, but we have had two changes of billets. I had my time full with the bathing. We took over the baths of a local mining company. There were 86 cubicles, each with a shower bath of hot water. While the men were bathing, we disinfected their clothes in a steam steriliser outside. It was a strenuous time for me, as I had seven hours a day in an atmosphere of steam. I saw all types of Indians. The amount of clothing they have is enormous. Gifts have been showered on them till they did not know what to do with them. Each man wore as much as possible. They dress themselves very slowly and won't be hurried. All native Indians have one trait in common. They will never completely strip in the presence of others. A couple of days ago I rode about 35 miles, mostly in a snowstorm, to secure new billeting quarters. After I came back, the CO told me that the brigade staff captain told him that I was coming on at billeting. In fact, he had great difficulty in riding me off the best spots. Here we struck the worst billets we have yet been in. The country is depressingly dreary and waterlogged. We were in poor farms. Three of us slept in a room full of potatoes, but these things don't worry me now. Today we moved into better billets in a small village nearby. Tomorrow we have to be ready to move at two hours' notice back to the firing line, once more to the magnesium flares and the guns. I have been watching our men practicing with the rifle grenade and bombs. Grenade warfare has revived many old methods, and grenade throwing has become a fine art. Each company has its bomb throwers. These go in front and throw their bombs, and the rest follow with the bayonets. End of section three. Section four of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section four. Connaught Rangers. Sixth of February, nineteen fifteen. I have been transferred for a week to a famous regiment, the Connaught Rangers, while their doctor goes on leave. We go up to the trenches in a couple of days, and I am expecting some new experience. My duty is to sit all day in my aid post, just behind the trenches, and fix up the men. If we go back to the old spot, I shall be at the bottom of that road, and someone else will have the pleasure of sprinting down to me. The dangers are increased in my new post, but one does not care, and I am not going to recklessly expose myself. I believe a big battle will be fought when we are up this time, and that will mean some strenuous work ahead of me. Just now I am sitting in a poor farmhouse. My room is cold and small and damp. I have my coat and muffler and balaclava cap on, and yet I feel cold. Oh, for a Queensland summer day, just to warm up. It's good to get back to the Irish accent again. I understand them, and that makes a lot of difference. My servant is a simple soul of the West. He solemnly told me yesterday that, in his opinion, the war would not be over until peace is signed. Another man gave a very good definition of a trench periscope, a thing you look in here and see there. As our billets are very scattered, I mess along with the priest, Father Pearl, a very lovable old man. He is very tolerant and of such a fine character that one instinctively likes him. Tomorrow he is going to give the men communion before we go up. He told me many tales of battles in which this fine regiment has been decimated, receiving the blessing on the battlefield before they dashed forward and upheld the name of their regiment. In this war, the Connaughts in particular have added to their glorious history. They came out here with 900 men, and were reduced at one time to 300. The present battalion is made up of the remnants of four, and this is not uncommon. Yesterday, a Tauber cruised over us and dropped not bombs, but leaflets. They apparently thought we were French. I enclose one as a souvenir. How futile the methods are. The leaflet was printed in French, and translated reads, French soldiers, the opinion widely circulated in your ranks that French prisoners are shot by the Germans is not true. On the contrary, they are absolutely well treated by the Germans. The artillery has been hard at it today, and my windows have been rattling with the concussion, though the guns are at some distance. 
Regarding your remarks on tetanus, we are not seeing so much of it now as at the end when we were on highly cultivated soil. You are correct about its main characteristics. The organism stays in the wound and the poison alone circulates. It shows a peculiar attraction for the brain and spinal cord and this of course makes its treatment more difficult. As a prophylactic, the serum is of undoubted value, but it is a matter of dispute if it has any remedial effect after the convulsions have started. Personally, I have grave doubts, and I know this is the opinion of those who have seen a lot of cases. We give prophylactic injections to all cases with wounds of the extremities. Whether one dose is sufficient and whether it has really stopped the onset of the trouble is a debatable point. All these points are being worked out by skilled laboratory men here. I can, however, tell you of the positive advantages of typhoid inoculation. All these cases go to my old base hospital at Bologna. So far there have been 250 cases in the whole expeditionary force, and 85% of these have occurred in non-inoculated cases. The majority of the others are those with doubtful histories of inoculation, or only one dose. Among those who have been inoculated and have contracted the disease, no deaths have occurred. These results have not yet been published, but they are authentic. Personally, I have had no time for research. My work is that of the clinician, and up here I only do first aid work. My duty is to evacuate the wounded as soon as possible, and to make them comfortable. Still, during my time at the base I got a good insight into the treatment of cases, and I know the value of rival treatments. 12th of February, 1915 I am again up in the firing line. We left our resting place early one morning, and trudged across country in the usual mud of varying density. I shall never complain again about any place after this war. We pitched our tents in a small village, where I had been previously. The billeting officer greeted me with the following cheery remarks. Sorry, old man, but a shell dropped on your billet a couple of days ago and killed a few people. I just smiled. One usually finds that once a shell lands on a given point, it is safe to go there for some time afterwards. I went to the house and found the courtyard spattered with blood and a big hole caused by a Jack Johnson. It was a stray shell which apparently had fallen short. The effect of the explosion was rather curious. On one side of the house, which was built round a hollow square, all the windows had been blown in, and also all the doors. Everything was in confusion in the rooms, and splinters of glass six inches long were sticking fast into the walls. The walls themselves and the ceiling were perforated. I got the mess cleared up, and soon made a snug corner, though a trifle airy. There was a wireless installation in the house, and I was rather suspicious about it. While here, the men going into the trenches were issued rubber boots and whale oil was served out. Frostbite, or something very much akin to it, has been a great trouble all winter. Both French and British medical authorities are agreed that it is not true frostbite. It is due to boots and putties being left on for long periods. The putties get wet and shrink a bit and contract the legs, interfering with the blood supply to the toes. As a result of this deprivation of blood, a condition of semi-gangrene sets in. To avoid it, we endeavour to get the men to take their boots off at least once a day and rub their feet. Whale oil is now being issued, and I do not know exactly why it has been chosen. It is a very heavy oil, and is poured into the boot, and allowed to work into the foot through the socks. I swapped my rubber boots for a bigger pair, and the further history of my old pair was rather tragic. During the afternoon, a battery of 4.7-inch guns began playing the good old game of dogging the rabbit gunner slang for shelling a position to drive the enemy out and then catching him as he runs back the noise was deafening the following day was wet and very cheerless we set out at four thirty p m for the trenches it had stopped raining and the sunset was visible we were nine hundred strong and stretched over a good long piece of road as we got near our objective the enemy began to shell us i have got inured to bullets but shells do make me funked as i freely admit it is not a nice sensation to hear the whistle as they pass over one's head and the more gurgly sound as they drop near the end luckily all the shells fell just behind us i found that my aid post was a deserted farmhouse well down the road to the trenches in fact the last house it was very comfortable and we had plenty of room there was only one part damaged and the big hole in the road just to remind one that such things had come over we soon got it into shipshape condition and were ready for action the trenches are about a thousand yards away, and this is a quiet spot compared to where I last was. I heard lately that the latter place was now abandoned, for the Germans had shelled it severely and knocked the roof off. This is a haven of rest compared to it, though it is a wonder they haven't stirred us up more. The last few days have been very clear, and aeroplanes have been busy. We all get under cover when one comes over, and then we watch the anti-aircraft guns at work. 
it is very noticeable how complete an ascendancy we have over the germans as regards aeroplanes no taubers have been here for months but we have had aviatics biplanes only one has gone up recently and two of ours soon settled him and made him retreat it was fascinating to watch our one circle round and round with german shrapnel bursting and going right into it quite unconcerned the german shell breaks with a much louder report than ours and the smoke is very dense and woolly hence the name given by our men to those shells woolly bears just as we are ahead of them in that line so we are with artillery this spot is a fair inferno of noise every afternoon with eighteen pounders and six inch howitzers blazing off and we get very few replies either the big guns are gone or else they have to husband their ammunition more nowadays what a curious life it is here and how one gets so used to it and just walks about heedless of the shells it is difficult to give you a picture of the actual front just a stretch of flat country intersected by trees and ruined houses about half a mile away is a ruin and some battered houses there are the reserves and in front of them the trenches one hundred and fifty yards in front of them are the germans between is a sea of mud anybody trying to cross that must go step by step through the mud and you can understand what slaughter the opposite side would make during any such attack that is why we do not advance at present we must just sit tight and wait and you at home read the papers and say there is nothing in them that is true regarding large movements but every day the artillery is at work and so are the rifles and snipers and each evening we have our share of killed and wounded nothing more dismal and depressing could be imagined than this black country of france we must stay in cold rooms all day as we cannot have smoke issuing out the chimneys at night we warm up the most impressive sight i have seen recently was the burial of three of our men one of whom came in wearing the boots i had discarded a young fellow who tried to find out what the enemy were doing in this direction and who paid the penalty we covered their heads and then each was carried up the street on a stretcher their bodies were quite exposed each in his mud-stained uniform and his hands stiff in rigor mortis there was a small cemetery along the road a new one with only wooden crosses but already too large there on a dull and cold winter afternoon they were quietly laid to rest never to return to the emerald isle at night everything is inky black one hears the challenge of sentries and the answers flares go up from the trenches and light up the country with a ghostly bluish white light throwing into relief the dark outline of farmhouses crack crack go the rifles and the rapid staccato stutter of the maxims is occasionally heard parties of men walk past in the gloom going down or returning from digging trenches or relieving those in them and sometimes stretcher bearers bring up wounded to me now and then a vivid flash and then the roar tells of big guns firing true it is a weird and unnatural existence but somehow one seems to have been always at it this slow waiting game has no glories but sometime soon we shall begin and then the medical staff will be overworked we all believe the end will come sooner than we expect and we live in that hope eighteenth of february nineteen fifteen i told you in my last about our guns bombarding the enemy vigorously but eliciting practically no reply one would sit all day in the post or wander up and down the road with impunity however one afternoon we stirred them up in earnest they got the range of our battery causing them the most trouble and let it have a good dose shells whistled over us but we did not mind later on i heard that all our transport had to be shifted to a safer spot then they began to search backwards dropping shells shorter each time that was where we came in as usual the medico got right in the way of it shells dropped all around us and knocked haystacks sky high i thought it was rather warm in my room and came outside as i did a shell landed on the roof of the billet opposite my window went through and did not burst until it reached the wall which was blown clean out the men were mostly outside watching the fun as they were covered in debris three men were knocked out by this time things were decidedly sultry we had no funk hole and had just to crouch against the wall and pray to god the next one did not land on us it was a terrorizing twenty minutes and one which i shall take a long time to forget we did not just hear the whistle of a passing shell but heard them coming then the swishing sound as they drop and then bang high explosive percussion shrapnel was being used i admit straight away that i was very funked still i managed to watch how the average tommy behaved thomas atkins is a marvel in many ways he absolutely disregards bullets and does not seem to care greatly about shells however he does not like bombs the men around me always run out to see where a shell burst when one has nothing to do just sheltering from shells is not pleasant to put it mildly but when you have a job on such as dressing wounds you do not mind nearly so much the following day i returned to the ambulance once more i had been asked by the senior medical officer in charge of the division to take a regular commission 
This time he definitely stated that these commissions were being offered to a few specially selected temporary men. While I greatly appreciate the honour he did me in including my name on that list, I refused again. The men here are keen for me to join, but the life does not offer any permanent attraction. I think you will share with me the pleasure of knowing that my work has met with official approval. I certainly am getting a variety of jobs. This time I have been in charge of the transport and Indian personnel. I did not fancy myself as a vet, but I get along as well as I can. Our natives have been very hard workers all along, and have done extremely good work under fire. There has been some slackness amongst only a few of them, and this has been checked by giving these few a good whipping. That appeals more to them than hard labour. Yesterday I was run into a new and yet old job. I am supposed to have a bit of a way with me regarding an Irish accent, and also able to persuade people to do things they do not want to do. The captain of a neighbouring battery had twenty men to be inoculated, and only six were willing. He came over for advice, and told us that the men were all London bus drivers, and the ringleader a regular Hyde Park orator. The acting O.C. promptly deputed me to try and talk them round, and meet them in debate. At first the gunner man did not want to include the orator, as he thought the latter would be too much for me. However, I said, let them all come. As you know, I had some experience with this type of ignorant objectors at Aldershot. So we met, and I talked simply to them, and told them about it and what I had seen at Bologna, where we had all the cases. I reminded them about the water supply here and the awful middens. Then I asked them to put any questions they had. The orator was soon at work, and quoted a case of death after injection, but I had read about the case and was ready for him. Eventually I got them all done, including the orator, and my O.C. and the other one were very pleased with the result. The Germans have been very busy in the last few days bombarding our lines. The town I was in at first, and from which I had to beat a hurried retreat, has got it badly. It wasn't much to look at then, but now many more homes have been hit. Several big ones have been absolutely blown to pieces. I was up there today, and a couple of shells whizzed over. It is remarkable how many German shells are blind, that is, do not explode, Recently at least 40% of their shells have not burst. This seems to point to deterioration in their manufacture. 27th of February, 1915. Our weather is slowly improving. The days are brighter, though recently we have had snow. But the country is absolutely waterlogged. You strike water one foot down. It is indescribably dreary and depressing. We live in an atmosphere of middens. When up at the front, we come round them, and then back we go to rows of smelly villages. However, the summer will be much worse. One often wonders what will happen if the lines do not move by the spring. At present, decomposing bodies lie in no man's land between the trenches, and have lain there since November. The men in the trenches can hardly dig now for disturbing corpses. They drained, or rather dragged, a certain trench near where we were recently, rather unwisely, I think, and they fished up numbers of dead bodies of officers and men posted as missing. There is no pleasant thing in war, just horror after horror. In one village where we had very large fighting, there are thousands of dead buried and many still above ground. That place should be razed entirely. Referring to the composition of the Indian forces, the writer states, Each brigade consists of four regiments, two British and two native. I am in the ambulance attached to the British section. All our personnel are natives, but we do not treat natives. They are looked after by the Indian medical service men. Of course, all our officers speak Hindustani. Our men are not high caste, and the weather has been very hard on them. But they have worked well. We left our advance station on the 24th. For some days before, the remains of the village where I first had to leave were heavily shelled. I went up one afternoon on an urgent message to collect some cases. We got there at 5 p.m. just when the shelling usually is on. No sooner there than the familiar whistle was heard, and a shell landed near us. I seem to attract any fire that is going. However, no more came over, and I was able to inspect my old and first village. This is so near the trenches that no inhabitants are left, and in fact few troops are now billeted there. The church had a few more holes in it. My dressing station also had a big hole just where my room was, but I was surprised to find that a big house opposite was now represented by a few bricks. It certainly was an object lesson as to what high explosives can do. Curiously, certain parts of the village were never hit. Shells seemed to have a limited zone of action, and needless to say, the centre of that zone was a church. I was very amused one morning to watch a new terrier regiment when our old friend the six-inch howitzer went off. They ran in all directions as they thought it was a shell bursting. We had considered that this place was beyond their range, but one night an eleven-inch one wandered over and fell about fifty yards from the hospital. Luckily it did not explode. End of section four.
Section five of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Second of March, nineteen fifteen. The following day, I resumed my old post as a billeting officer and rode about twenty-two miles in all to our new area. I enjoyed the exercise, though I was very stiff. One gets so little chance of decent exercise. When up at the trenches, one of course gets none. Back here it is not much better, for the roads are blocked by motor traffic and the country is not very inviting. The day began fairly well, then it snowed heavily, and finally sleet. In all, one could not have been much more uncomfortable. We all arrived very tired and out of temper, and the poor billets did not improve matters. The next morning was snowing, and then fine. As usual, the period of resting was to be for me one of hard work, much more so than when further up. The division arranged a beautiful scheme on paper, and left me to carry it out. I suppose I should take it as a compliment that while the other brigades have appointed majors, and of course regulars, to look after the baths, I was given charge of my brigade. We searched everywhere for a suitable spot, and found none. The village was crammed full of troops, and there was no central spot for bathing. Eventually I had to leave that to the regiments, and contented myself with the washing and issuing of clean kits. For this I got one of the schoolhouses. Then I saw the mayor, and arranged for a gendarme to go round and beat up all the women who would wash. When eleven turned up at the Mary, we discussed prices and arrived at a flat rate of ten centimes, one penny, per garment, I to supply soap, soda, and undertake drying the clothes. I made one room of the schoolhouse my storeroom. The other was hung with ropes and used as a drying room heated by coke braziers. The method of procedure is as follows. Regimental carts come up daily, and I give out clean sets, shirt, vest, drawers, and socks, and they return later with dirty ones in exchange. These are put in the steriliser and steam-heated, and so rendered less lively. My natives then make them up into sets. The washerwomen take away as many as they like, and return them the next day. They are then hung up to dry in this room, outside if fine, and above the boilers in an oil cake factory nearby. Today was fine, and outside the schoolhouse every tree and fence and clothesline was adorned. Then they are bundled up ready for issue. All this sounds easy, but in practice it is a great worry. First of all, I had to wait a long time for my supplies of soap, soda and coal. Regiments groused to the general that I was not giving them enough, but he knew my difficulties and took my part. But I have also two other side shows to keep me out of mischief. Our ambulance has been divided temporarily into two sections, and the one remaining here has made me mess president. That means going out for provisions, etc. Then headquarters presented me yesterday with a new preparation, vermigelli, and asked me to report on its value. It looks like axle grease, and is supposed to kill lice and fleas, and makes you proof against them. I seized the nearest native, and found on him plenty of material for experiment. Rubbing on the jelly certainly kills the lively lads. Then I tried a solution and soaked shirts in it. The beggars were apparently dead, and I hung up the shirts to dry, when they promptly came to life again. Finally I made the native bathe, and then anointed him all over, giving him clean underclothing and his old tunic, which had been treated well. Now I am watching to see how long he will remain proof. Such is the way I feel in a day here. It is certainly doing something, and I get no rest the whole day long. I don't quite see where the medicine and surgery come in, but it is my job. I needn't complain of monotony. The weather is showing a decided improvement. We get beautiful blue skies and a strong drying wind. The nights are moonlight also at present. What a change to the last couple of months. But this waterlogged region could do with a month of Queensland summer. 9th of March, 1915. I am still busy with the washing arrangements. Things went along quickly once we got into the swing of affairs. However, I have learned by this how long it takes to dry woolens. In fact, I am rapidly qualifying for an expert laundryman. Today we received orders to close down, and tomorrow we move up closer again. There is a bustle in the air, and all day very heavy firing has been going on. I suspect a lot, and I think that before long the stagnation of the winter will have given way to fiercer slaughter than anything we have had so far. We all recognise that April and May will be bad months. The weather has been extremely cold again and snow has fallen, but on the whole it is drier and sunnier. Up to this I haven't given you a detailed account of how the RAMC works. The first link in the chain is the stretcher bearers. In peace times these are the bandsmen, who get special instructions. Each regiment has about sixteen of these. They may stay up in the trenches with their companies, or else remain behind with the medical officer handling the wounded. 
When a casualty occurs, they apply the first aid dressing and also iodine to the wound. At first they did not carry iodine, but now they always do so. Then the wounded man is brought back by night, I am speaking of the conditions of trench warfare, to the regimental aid post. Here is the medical officer. The aid post is some building behind the trenches at a varying distance from 200 to 1,000 yards. While out of the rifle fire, it is usually well within the range of shells, as I found out some weeks ago. The medical officer may or may not redress the wound, the less it is interfered with the better. He usually contents himself with giving the man a warm drink, tea is always on and often some soup. In addition, the wounded get morphia. As far as operations go, practically none are done, because there are no facilities for them. Beyond setting fractures under anaesthetics and controlling hemorrhage by tourniquet, nothing is attempted. The next link is the field ambulance. They are mobile units and stay up in some village about four miles or so behind the firing line. In the British Army the transport is motor, but we in the Indian have to rely on the old horse wagons. We hope soon to remedy this. At regular hours, day or night, the ambulance comes up to evacuate the aid posts. A medical officer goes with them and looks after the wounded. This part of the chain is often the most dangerous. We have to go down roads swept by bullets, and shells, often quite accidentally, I am sure, find us or go pretty near. Wagons come to some spot where they can shelter, and the stretchers are taken by a party down to the aid post. The ambulance is stationed usually in a schoolhouse or a large barn. Here, for the first time, can operations be performed under fairly aseptic or antiseptic conditions. The wounded are entered and classified, their wounds redressed, and then they get a warm drink and get put to sleep. Any urgent operations are also performed. The next stage is to the casualty clearing station, and this is always at railhead in some town. Each station is the centre for several ambulances. Motor cars come out and evacuate the cases from the ambulances. In fact, these places are really glorified field ambulances with bigger and better accommodation and at a railway. This is the furthest up a nurse can go. The men are redressed here if necessary, but more important they get bathed and cleaned up. On account of this, they are usually known as cleaning stations. If you could see the condition of the poor fellows, you would understand how this term arose. Then comes the ambulance train, a magnificent hospital, and a quick and gentle transit down to the base. That brings us to the general and stationary hospitals, with every convenience known to civilization. From there they are sent by hospital ships home. That is a rough outline of the way we send back casualties. For the sick men it may be different. Each regimental doctor sees his sick and determines who must go back. They then reach the field ambulance where all those likely to get better in three days are kept. The others go to the clearing station and are kept a fortnight. If not better, they go to the base and are then drafted in groups for home or for the convalescent camp from where they return to duty. The scheme works well and there is no doubt that we have the best medical corps of any of the belligerents. This war has completely upset all the book instructions gathered from the South African War. End of section 5Section 6 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 18th of March, 1915. Referring to previous remarks about the roads, the main ones are good, in the centre. The smaller roads are just tracks and nothing more. In this black country they are the main arteries going between the towns, and there are also a maze of small roads. The traffic has been abnormal, and there is no room for big lorries to pass, and both keep on the paved section. Once a wagon gets off the road, down it goes up to the axles. However, the weather is rapidly improving, and the roads are drying up fast. I suppose in summer this region will be very hot and dusty. Since I last wrote, the great battle of Nerve Chapelle has occurred. You will have read about it, but perhaps I can give you some idea of it, as this is where I have been all along, and being my first big fight I am naturally proud to have been in it. Ever since I came up from the base we have worked this sector of the line, and I especially have been all about it, and been well baptised with fire. The preparations for this thrust were very well laid. Everything was done in secrecy, and no one knew exactly where the push was to be made. By night, regiment after regiment went up until the area behind Nerve Chapelle was packed with troops. For several months we had been getting an ascendancy over them as regards artillery, especially of the heavy variety. All round here big guns bristle in almost every hedge. As for aeroplanes, we simply disregard them, for only one ever came up, and it always ran away. Then came de tag. The artillery blazed away for about forty minutes, 
The noise was awful, and nobody had heard anything like it before. There were more than two hundred guns at work at once. The air simply pulsated and whirred. One can only imagine what the inferno was like in the German trenches. Most of the men were dead, and the rest surrendered as our men charged. Though the effect was terrible on the Germans, our men say that they could not have stood it much longer. This artillery fire was the most concentrated that has yet been used in the war. The Germans were surprised, but as usual fought well, and with reserves pouring up a great battle ensued, but our men were not to be denied, and we have made an appreciable straightening of the line. Now for the medical aspect. The work was terrific, for such an attack means a heavy casualty list. Though it is not as bad as being in the trenches, still we had a very strenuous time. Day work was not very safe, and most of our trips were done in pitch darkness. We had to go down roads swept by shrapnel and machine guns. Every few yards we had to rush to the ditch and lie down as a shell came over. The sights we saw were awful. A battlefield is not a pretty sight. Down this road, absolutely cut to pieces by the traffic and shells, and covered with dead and wounded, were men groaning and crying for help mid the screaming of shells. At one spot shrapnel had blown a lot of men into the ditch where they drowned, dead men sitting up in the water, Germans and British mixed. It was absolute hell. Our aid post was hit several times, and one man killed when upstairs. Up there one has not the slightest idea of how the fight is going. The wildest rumours go round, but whether we are advancing or retreating nobody knows. We have just to go on, night and day, and get evacuated as soon as possible. Our native bearers were wonderful. They are from the bazaars and have no military training, but they carried men for two miles and had to sleep what little time they had in the open. We were very proud of them. Several were killed by bullets. Two things stand out. The brilliant way in which the Indian troops fought, and also how the territorials played the game. The Indian knows what to do in the open, but trench work was new and strange to him. This time they fairly got their blood up, and the Germans suffered accordingly. One lot of Gurkhas got surrounded by three German regiments and cut their way out. The Germans surrendered by the hundred. Some tried treachery after holding their hands up. The majority of these were shot after being captured. Others were decapitated at once by the Indians. After the battle, the piles of dead were awful, and they are still there. Modern battle is pure carnage, and there are few redeeming features except the bravery of the men. I made a point of questioning several German wounded about the condition of affairs in their lines. They were all well fed and in very good condition. They did not have K-bread served out, and in fact did not have so bad a time at all. They were very respectful about our shrapnel, but one can only write home and try to impress people with the fact that the German army is still very much alive. They are not on their last legs by a long way, and the task before us yet is stupendous, though we shall pull through in the long run. Nobody here takes them cheaply. They are a very brave enemy, though very unscrupulous. We are now resting, and will be very soon up again to await any fresh developments. 25th of March, 1915 the heavy fighting is over for the present, and both sides are resting. We have had some ideal weather with the roads dried up, and actually dusty. It was a very welcome change. But March won't let us rest long with any kind of weather, and we are again having rain and the good old mud. However, the days are really improving, and so are our spirits. The papers have expended a lot of adjectives over Nerve Chapelle. We have also after reading them. They all give the whole credit to the British divisions, whereas they were not there at all. The people who did the job were the Indians and the white regiments in the Indian cause. We are rather fed up by the natives not getting their proper share of praise, but doubtless in the official dispatch later that will be put right. After the main affair, the Germans continued to shell the church in the village behind. They used up over 200 shells before they got the spire. Naturally they wanted to get it, for we used it as an observation post. In addition, they dropped shells regularly into all the surrounding villages, old haunts of mine, and in several cases caught our men. One medical officer had his arm blown off. When leave was last opened, the Indian army were rather badly treated, compared with our British colleagues. However, as a kind of reward after Nerve Chapelle, leave has again been opened for us. I have been hard at it since September 11, with never a day off, while practically every officer with as long service has had at least two short periods of leave. On previous occasions my leave was blocked through my taking charge of the baths, and again I have been placed on this duty, but I hope to get away in another week. I will enjoy a change even for a couple of days from the mud and monotony of Flanders, and also away from shells. A couple of nights ago we heard a zeppelin passing over us, but luckily it did not worry us. Taubers have been busy lately, but they have done little damage. 11th of April, 1915 
My holiday was a very welcome break. It was good to get away from the farms and all that is comprised in the magic phrase, the front. One has few delusions now about war. I gloated over the peaceful downs of England, and life going on very much as ever. But I think that the folks at home are beginning to realise something at last. Our heavy losses at Neuve Chapelle have made them think a bit. I found all sorts of rumours regarding that battle, most of them half right, but I was astonished and very angry when I was coolly told that the British troops won the day. The village was taken by the Indian corps, British and native. The price paid was heavy, but still worth it. There was some bungling, but those responsible for it were removed, and you may rest assured that if a man fails, he promptly goes. There is no room for failures in this campaign. The return passage across the channel was very rough. We apparently had no escort, and I was wondering what would have happened if we had been caught. Before we left Folkestone, all the boats were slung out in readiness. The trip up country was made by supply train. It was slow and not too comfortable. Then I came to my unit on a supply wagon. Two days later I was ordered to join the Highland Light Infantry as medical officer, and I am with them at present resting. But this is not permanent, for when a man comes up from the base, I shall return to the field ambulance. I am having a very busy time, as we are taking precautions to prevent the spread of disease during the warmer weather. End of section 6 Section 7 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 22nd of April, 1915 I have been extremely busy, and am very glad of it. With the approach of summer, our sanitary precautions have to be greatly increased, and it has been along those lines that we have been working at present. Naturally, all measures are carried out in the open air. The usual closet in this country is an old friend, the deep hole with superstructure. We dig short, shallow trenches three feet by two by one. One trench is allowed to every twenty men in the billet, and they are filled in daily and fresh ones dug. This is better than leaving them open for a longer period. The earth is piled up alongside and kicked in after use. Chloride of lime is also plentifully sprinkled about. Small holes with a layer of stones at the bottom are used as urine pits. All grease and fluids are poured over straw and branches, which catch the solid particles and allow the fluid to drain into a deeper pit and thence soak away. Every day these branches and their catch are burnt and fresh ones put down. All tins and solid refuse are placed in incinerators, which are hollow mounds of brick or earth with holes below and open top. These smoulder away all day and completely burn anything placed in them. What is left, chiefly tins, is placed in a pit and eventually filled over with earth. Horse litter and manure are either taken to fields some distance off or burnt in large incinerators. In addition, there are several features peculiar to and typical of this flat country. All the farmhouses here are low square buildings built around a central midden. This is usually liquid below and covered with straw and manure, though in many cases it is simply a liquid cesspool. The prospect of these in summer is truly awful. How the people live here beats one. They get epidemics among the children of what is termed scarlatina, but what I believe is a mild form of enteric. One could hardly wonder at it. So we are now turning our attention to such conditions. There are two ways of dealing with them. Clean them out entirely, or cover them with chloride of lime and earth. The former has not been possible, so they have been all covered over. However, this does not prevent the people from putting more on top. Eventually, I expect men will be appointed in sanitary squads permanent in areas to deal with them. The other trouble is the stagnant water in ditches along the roads. This is absolutely stationary, as there is no fall considerable enough to allow drainage. Before long, these will all have to be cleared out, probably by refugee labour. We have got also water testing outfits, and in any case, all drinking water is tested before use. But in the advance we shall have a lot to do in this line, especially as our foes will probably destroy all the pumps and also poison the water. This duty is another change, and I like it. All week my work has been duplicated, as I was in charge of a Gurkha battalion. Their man was away on leave. The natives are very much cleaner than white men, and their billets are kept very clean. The OC has asked me to lecture the senior non-commissioned officers and the junior officers on sanitation in the billets and the trenches. I begin tomorrow. I do not know yet whether I am permanent with the regiment. I have seen the ADMS and asked him to allow me to remain. He is rather averse to breaking up a field ambulance. The OC is very keen for me to remain with them. This week we were inspected by the Commander-in-Chief. 23rd of April, 1915. We have just had a long march up to the reserve billets in a blinding dust storm. That is going to be a problem this summer. Mud in winter and now dust. 
we are back again to the old sound of big guns, and within range of Jack Johnson's also. Instead of getting a night's rest, we have just got orders to stand fast for a very interesting move, about which I cannot say more just now. But if it comes off, we shall be in for a very warm time. It means sleeping tonight in one's clothes. This extract was written on a scrap of paper, as the writer explains, All my kit is packed, and I am only carrying necessities. 29th of April, 1915 since last writing I have been, and still am, going through a very inferno. We have been brought up to Belgium to the great battle now on. The artillery fire is something awful. Today it culminated in Jack Johnson's four at a time all round my aid post. The church of the village and several farms are blazing. Most of the houses are blown down, and our turn may come at any time. Nerve Chapelle was a flea bite to this, but if I get out alive I shall have a lot to write to you about. I am with the Highland Light Infantry. 3rd of May, 1915. I want just to send word that I have come safely through. We are on our way back for a well-deserved rest. This week has been a nightmare and we are lucky to be alive. Those who know what they are talking about say that it was worse than Mons and certainly Nerve Chapelle. The last 48 hours were one of constant bombardment. 6th of May, 1915. The past fortnight has been a very strenuous one, and it was impossible for me to write fully to you during that time. Even now we are under orders to move up after one day's rest, and it is very hard on the men. It would probably be better if I gave you my experience straight from my diary, first of all telling you why we were suddenly moved up into Belgium. As you will have read, the Germans used gas on the French and forced them to retire, leaving our left flank unprotected. This was composed of Canadians, and they fought magnificently, but had to retire to keep in line with the others. At any time the salient at Ypres was pretty acute, and by this considerable success the Germans gave us an extra bulge. To hold them up and try to force them back, large reinforcements were sent up. So we who had just come up to the reserve billets in our own area suddenly got orders to do a forced march. The whole division, roughly 16,000 men, began the long trek at midday on the 24th. We marched on and on through new country, and eventually at 1 a.m. reached our billets, dead beat and foot sore, and rain falling. We were off again at 7 a.m., and it was hard work. By this time we had left the flat country which had been our lot for so many months, and we were in quite hilly parts on the Belgian frontier. But we were not in the mood for going into raptures over scenery. However, one could not help noticing that the farms were more substantial and cleaner, and that there was an air of prosperity quite foreign to our own part of the line. At midday we reached a lot of huts in a field, and here we stopped until the following day. The men were dead beat and needed a rest. I got little chance of repose, as I had a foot parade, and was busy getting the men patched up, as we were going into action the following day. That evening we had an open-air service, and it was good to hear the old hundredth sung in the familiar Scotch accents. The guns were making a great noise all night. 26th of April at 6 a.m., after getting loaded up with extra ammunition and discarding all transport, we pushed off, still not knowing what lay in front of us. After passing through a small town, we got to the outskirts of Ypres. That old town is a terrible example of what artillery fire can do. Everything in ruins, and still they are bombarding it. But we hadn't much time to worry about it. Just before we reached it, we were told of casualties in the battalions ahead of us. Each battalion spread out as much as possible, and hugged the hedges all the time. Later on we learnt that this was the only road out of the town, and that the Germans had its range to an inch, especially the pontoon bridge over the canal. On we went, blissfully ignorant of all this, until with a roar a Jack Johnson landed about fifty yards to one side. We passed many dead horses, and several poor men. We got out of Ypres as fast as possible, and had several more shells near us. Our objective was a small village, on a hill, about one and a half miles out, and near it we ran into a lot of shrapnel. I got one bit on the head, but it did no damage. But I did sprint near the end and dive into a ditch. It fairly winded me. The battalion now laid down in a field in the open. Behind and in front of us were batteries. The Germans opened fire, and soon shrapnel and coal boxes were sailing over us, but luckily doing no damage. Coming up that road from Ypres, every battalion lost men. Ours were slight, only two. We lay in this field from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Meanwhile the officers gathered in at Jack Johnson's hole, and we had the orders read out, and I arranged about an aid post. At 2 p.m. our guns had half an hour's bombardment, followed by five minutes rapid fire. As you can imagine, the noise was pretty bad. Then our men advanced in open formation. 
the german shrapnel came over in dozens and the fields were hidden often in clouds of smoke big shells fell too among the men and big and little ones came over behind to where the batteries were meanwhile i had gone down into a valley and chosen a post thank goodness i did not stay there long but advanced up to the village to be nearer my men for later on that spot was an inferno just prior to the attack i had given out baking soda to each man to use on his wet handkerchief against the gases which are used in this sector while all fire was being directed on the advancing troops i managed to fix up my aid post we got to the end house an estaminet or inn it had previously been used by the canadians a big new house on the opposite side partially sheltered us from the trenches the first thing was to look for a dugout we used a cellar which was only partially underground but that had to do though i knew full well that one good hit and the house would have fallen in on us all as there was nothing more to do until the cases were brought in we just cleaned up the place and got ready there were two rooms in front which we used for cases i slept in the cellar and behind we had a kitchen and some outhouses the inn had a loft above these rooms and then a tile roof not much protection if a shell burst through at the other end of the village about one hundred and fifty yards off was a crossroad and a church the germans landed shells on this spot with absolute precision between that corner and my place were houses and two field ambulances had dressing stations in them we were on undulating land between two ridges about four miles or so apart from the end of the house you could see where the germans were and also watch our men advancing in the open so much for the general lie of the land i had proposed going on past this village and the chance of being blown up to a farm a little further on but three other men were there later events proved the wisdom of this it was impossible to receive wounded during the day and the rush did not come until night i got men of every regiment just anybody who wandered along the roads i was up all night and what a row was on shells came across every minute and one heard rifle fire and maxims all the time at five a m it was dead quiet and what a relief though it did not last long twenty seventh of april at seven a m i managed to lie down on a heap of potatoes and soon was sound asleep being dead beat after the marches and my night's work even the heavy bombardment did not disturb me the highland infantry began to advance and i went upstairs for a time to watch them with my glasses this is the time when one feels an awful rotter sitting in comparative safety while others are advancing over open ground with shrapnel and big shells simply pouring over them it was a fine sight to see the jocks advance though now and then a figure would be bowled over meanwhile we got our share the house opposite was hit fair and square and a big hole made and my outhouses were damaged i got all my cases down into the cellar i now saw the advantage of being at the far end of the village for the germans systematically shelled the crossroads and the church and surrounding houses they were not far from me but apparently the range was not altered these crossroads had some trophies dead horses two motor cars and today a brigadier general it was absolutely unsafe to pass by except at a gallop 28th of april the bombardment continued especially of the crossroads and houses one field ambulance cleared out and the other had to take to its cellars with the house in ruins over it and i have had to look on and wonder when my turn is coming for the intervals between us is only fifty yards the french made an attack on our left but it came to nothing owing to gas being used again it was a light day for me as our men were not attacking during the day one sees no traffic on the roads simply a few motorcycle riders tearing along at full speed and also ammunition limbers coming up with fresh supplies at night up come the ration parties and they all stop in front of my place the wounded are evacuated day and night though if the shelling is bad only at night it is wonderful how these red cross cars dash along the roads and come so far up in broad daylight they are a brave lot twenty ninth of april there was the usual high explosive demonstration against the batteries in the early morning with little appreciable result so far i have not told you about those batteries after the canadians retreated this battery took up its present position it is composed of eighteen pounders three point three inch a good field gun but not of the weight required to put out of action the heavy metal the germans have brought up they lie about one hundred yards behind me and also in neighbouring fields when we arrived they had fired about eleven thousand rounds and since then they have been hard at it day and night one gets used to the bark of an eighteen pounder though it is not pleasant but i take off my hat to the number ten canadian battery they are our only support and the germans have got their range and send over all sorts of big stuff german gunnery is good but they have been aided by spies several of whom were caught today with all this continued bombardment one is getting a bit pessimistic where are our heavy guns where are our reserves and where are our aeroplanes 
Today we had no less than four Taubers over us, dropping smoke bombs, and of course followed by a heavy bombardment. We got our revenge on one. He came low down, and the whole line of our men opened with rifle fire and brought him down. But the Germans did not let us keep the plane, for by shell fire they wrecked it. In the afternoon the village was very heavily shelled, and towards evening the church and one of the houses caught fire, and we had a big blaze. The Germans used this as a target, and plugged more shells over. The hospitals were heavily shelled also, and they were abandoned later that evening. Now I am the sole occupant of the village, and a poor honour it is to be sure. Some of my men went up to the abandoned hospitals and brought down stores for us. We found two dead men and gave them a decent burial. In the fields nearby are some cows. We have collared one and so have fresh milk. Two pigs wander about, and really they lead a charmed life, for nothing ever hits them. I hope to continue this when we reach our next billet. They gave us one day's rest, and now we are moving up in support of our own sector. Truly, life is anything but a bed of roses just now. 30th of April Another heavy bombardment of the fields behind us, though the village was left alone. Some of the hits were very close to us. All through my letter I have mentioned a heavy bombardment, but you can have little idea of what exactly it means. All this week we have been overwhelmed by the German artillery. They have turned the tables on us in revenge for Neuve Chapelle. What a variety of shots come over from three different directions. First of all we had the Ypres Express, the big 17-inch shells going straight on to that town. They made a big noise, but that was nothing. Next in size were the Jack Johnsons, or coal boxes. These whirred over us all day long, and when they burst, sent up an enormous cloud of dense black smoke. In addition, they left some holes in the ground. Ordinary shrapnel with its fleecy clouds was very common. Then there was the whiz-bang or pipsqueak. This shell, unlike the others, gave you no notice of its approach. All you heard was a sudden phew bang. It was very local in its action. The most terrifying, though, was a rather mysterious shell. It sounded like one, but gave three explosions, and I could never be sure whether it was one shell or a series of three. But the explosion fairly sounded. It was like prump, 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 and usually immediately after it came some shrapnel. In addition, we had plenty of ordinary lidite. During the whole week, we never had more than one hour without shells coming over. At one period, we had 48 hours continuous fire. My house simply shook like a leaf at times from the explosions, and once I was knocked down by the air from a shell. It felt just like an iron hand pushing me over. As you can well imagine, one did not feel exactly happy with all this fire. The batteries were only just behind me, and one never knew when a shot just a bit short might get us. However, I had to stay on and risk it. During the evening the artillery fire was worse than on any previous night, and three farms and some houses nearby were burning. 1st of May at 9 a.m. I got a message to come and see the O.C. in the trenches. Off I went across country right up to our second line. I did not feel too brave going over those fields in broad daylight in full view of the Germans, but beyond getting some shrapnel over me nothing happened. The fields were simply riddled with holes big and little. Many of them had a curious little trough at one side where apparently the shell had entered before exploding. The appearance of the hole may be described as an oval with a small projecting lip at one end where the shell entered. The men were all dug in, and I saw the O.C. in his dugout. However, I am not very keen on wandering over a battlefield just between attacks in daylight. That afternoon our men attacked, and made a magnificent charge, but we had to stop short. But it was grand to watch our men going on. Of course the aftermath came when I got the wounded in. I shall always remember that night. I was hard at it from 7 p.m. to 4.30 a.m. without stopping. Cases poured in, and soon I had every room full, and all the outhouses, and even outside. Outside it was fair hell. Shells were coming over in dozens. The houses near me were on fire. My own place was hit, and next morning I found that one shell had landed in the back yard. But I was too busy to notice any of this. By the dim light of two candles I was bending over stretcher cases and wading through field dressings. At the end I could hardly stand I was so dead beat. I managed to get them all safely away at 5 a.m., and then we packed up as the regiment had left some hours previously. With another medical man equally tired, I walked down over part of the battlefield and then through Ypres. It was dead calm, and we got away safely. But what a number of dead horses were lying about, and some poor fellows, too. The stench was something awful. I should liken this road from the outskirts of Ypres up to where I was, to the valley of the shadow of death. The Germans had its range, and woe betide the wayfarer. One had to rush through it at any time, and the odds were against him. 
It consisted of ruined houses and great holes in the road, and wrecked transport and dead horses and poor drivers too. And yet that Sunday morning as we passed the worst spot, at the pontoon bridge over the canal, we heard music from one house. A few Tommies wandering back were going through the houses looking for anything, and chancing on a piano were strumming a comic song. Truly Thomas Atkins is a wonderful being. I was dead beat when I got back to the regiment, but I had more work to do. However, I had done my best under conditions which, to say the least, were not very pleasant or healthy, and the reward I got was very heartening. The colonel of the field ambulance, to whom my cases had gone, sent me a message saying that my cases were the best dressed he had ever seen, and he congratulated me on them. They were all sent on at once to the train. Our padre was also there, and he said that our men looked quite different from those of other regiments, and that they were all very grateful for what we had done. My own colonel and the officers of the regiment were very pleased at this also. Don't think that I am boasting in mentioning all this, but I had a terrible week, such as you cannot imagine, and was lucky to come out safe, and the last night was no joke. But when I heard that praise, I had a feeling that there are rewards not tangible, but just as precious, which a doctor only can get. I did my best, and that was all about it, for I couldn't have done anything else. End of section 7 Section 8 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 10th of May, 1915. I did not meet with any gas cases, for we did not have much in front of us. The regiments nearby suffered severely. One hardly need waste space complaining of such methods. We shall just have to lick them by similar means if ordered to do so, or by sternly fighting on. Apparently chlorine is the gas most in use, though other gases are emitted also the great thing we have to do is to reassure the men they don't mind ordinary warfare but this is something unknown the gas can of course be seen by day and at night a hissing sound betrays its issue from the pipes until the men get respirators the only thing to do is to retire from the trenches and then to charge back through it when the fumes have dissipated a bit hand bombs will help to break up the fumes also the chemical means of getting rid of it are solution of hypo used in clearing and fixing photographic negatives and washing soda these are now supplied to the troops the effects on the men are simply devilish and it does make one's blood boil to have to stand by and be of such little use we shall make them pay up for all this later another thought which strikes me is the comparative inefficiency of a large part of all artillery bombardments we probably went through a week of more concentrated fire than any troops ever did yet ninety nine per cent of the shots went into earth and did no material damage the fields certainly were simply pitted but beyond that little damage was done it made one rather feel that after all if a shell was going to hit you it would despite what precautions you took and that in the meantime you could go on with your work and disregard them i was very amused one afternoon watching a lot of our men chasing some cows over the fields with their canteens amid quite a respectable amount of shrapnel our journey back to the old spots was uneventful though very fatiguing all marches have to be done by night and it is hard to keep going i was getting quite an expert at walking along practically asleep we found that some mouth organs were a great help to make us forget the never-ending kilometres after resting a day we were warned for another great attack now on and weary though we are the men were keen to get a bit of their own back that battle is now raging and more i cannot say yet yesterday the general came to us and read out smith dorian's thanks to the lahore division it confirmed what i had thought about the whole business when the germans broke through they seriously threatened ypres and if they had got over the canal banks would have cut off a large number of our men and compelled them to surrender we were rushed up and to quote the second army's commander's words without adequate artillery preparation and against an overwhelming artillery maxim and rifle fire together with a glacis position and poisonous gases you stopped further progress while only partially successful in attacking them you prevented any advance and enabled the lines to be rearranged and thus in spite of heavy casualties saved your comrades this is something to be proud of and i am glad i was in such an action we had terrible losses but we did what was wanted and prevented any possible sedan occurring to-day i was ordered to return to my old field ambulance i wanted to remain with the regiment but ever since i left the colonel has been trying to get me back i should be pleased to be considered worth having the ambulance has had to give up all its regular officers to other units lately and there were a lot of new chums who had never heard a gun fired so naturally as a veteran i was wanted the colonel was good enough to say that he looked on me as his right-hand man 
I am acting second in command now, and specialist in advanced operative surgery, besides looking after the transport. All of which are honorary, but I feel that I have been of some use up at the front, and that means a lot. I am giving my best all the time. 15th of May, 1915. Referring to some letters received from Brisbane. The nurses you refer to, and as many more Australian nurses as possible, will be very welcome here. I read lately that many of them had been rejected by the War Office regulation refusing to recognise them, unless from hospitals of over 100 beds. But we need every nurse available, for already amateurs with only a few months' training are being sent out. I need hardly say that I feel pleased that my letters are of such interest. One is often tired when writing, but it is cheering to know that they are appreciated. By this time you will be getting full details of the Dardanelles, and Australia has cause to be proud of the way her boys went ashore. It was different from our warfare, but the same old spirit shows forth. Referring to the destruction by gas of Prickly Pear. It is a pity we could not have some of that arsenical preparation for Prickly Pear to use on the Huns. Since last writing, the measures we have taken against chlorine gas have been very successful. The men have waited while the fumes passed by, and then fired on the advancing Germans. The pads, or respirators, are soaked in a solution of theosulfate of soda, hypo. For the last week this ambulance has been doing nothing, and time has hung heavy on our hands. But the fight has been going on steadily, and the loss of life has been something appalling. For over a week now three fights have been going on. To our north, at Ypres, the struggle still continues. After we came back, new troops came up, and the fight became even more desperate. The Germans have been pushing us back very slowly, and it would not surprise me if the town fell. But then we would have a straightened line and a better position. Meanwhile, the French, just below our line, have made a very marked progress, and still are pushing on. Last weekend we made an attack here, and I rather think it was meant to be an elaborate feint to relieve the French and the British at Ypres. Of course, we would have gone on if successful. This part of the line is very strongly protected, and our attack did not succeed. The Germans retired during the preliminary bombardment to dugouts, or rather, subterranean passages reinforced by concrete and practically shell-proof. When our men advanced, they came back to the mined first-line trenches. It was the same old tale of British doggedness against a withering fire, but we were held up. I wish the slackers at home could only see how our blood is being poured out here for them. If they could only see the barbed wire thick with corpses, or rows of men mown down by maxim fire, perhaps then they would come out and help us. The plain truth of the fighting recently is that instead of pushing the Germans, we are being put to our utmost to hold them in. Don't think I am despondent, but when one has been battered about as I was recently, it certainly destroys any optimistic feelings. As I write, the big guns are thundering out again preparatory to another attack, and this one we hope will be successful. The country is looking very well just now. The trees have become covered with leaves and the hawthorn blooms under a blue sky. Flanders looks pretty, and what a contrast to the winter. But within three miles of here, thousands of corpses lie unburied, and more are added to them daily. The grim harvest is still being gathered in, and there are many more days to go. 20th of May, 1915. We are still resting and doing nothing, though our men are not remaining so quiescent. At the beginning of the week, the Indian troops kept the Huns busy opposite here, while the 7th Division swooped in on them lower down and made a great advance. But as usual, our luck with the weather was dead out. The wind always blows towards us, or else fog and rain come on, and the latter occurred this time. The attack rather took the Germans by surprise. The artillery fire was very heavy, and from prisoners we heard it was very successful. It was so intense that the ration wagons could not come up to the trenches, and for twenty-four hours the Germans were without food. The men who surrendered were a very weedy lot, quite different from the usual. But all who desired to give themselves up did not manage to do so. One lot were spotted by their own side, who promptly began to fire on them. As we could not get them, we put our artillery on them also, and between the two fires not a man remained. The guards also came to a lot who put up their hands, but to no avail. Our men simply wiped them out, and refused to be held back by their officers. One cannot blame them after what the Germans have done to our men, especially the wounded. A Prussian officer was being led back under escort near here, and made some offensive remark to his escort, who promptly bayoneted him on the spot. The last three weeks have been an orgy of slaughter, but one has got used to that now. We only think in thousands as regards casualties. The methods of the Germans have so aroused our men that nothing will hold them in. They are exacting a tribute from the Huns for all their misdeeds. In the last advance the Germans had no gas cylinders, though they used asphyxiating bombs, 
but probably after this enforced halt they have brought up the gas however with our masks and helmets we are prepared for them so far we have not used any gas ourselves but it is not because we have any squeamish feelings the losses we sustained were comparatively slight in the attack much less than we expected and the germans are said to have lost ten thousand for a fortnight now they have had reverses all along the western line and their losses must have been enormous but we haven't taken the fight out of them yet by a long way we know that their nineteen fifteen class has been called up and is being used and we hope that soon the terrible drain will tell on them meanwhile we are being faced like you with a serious shortage of water there are so many men concentrated in a small area that most of the wells are running dry probably we shall have to drink canal water before long as it is water for animals and washing purposes is taken entirely from the ditches as we advance the problem will increase for we may be sure that all the wells will be poisoned the old grandmothers the fifteen-inch howitzers have been busy lately with good results one old lady was told off to obliterate a certain town the first shot went five hundred yards wide much to the gunners disgust the next day the general congratulated them on their work and said that this shot had absolutely wiped out a german battery round this same gun were three houses when the first shot was fired one house collapsed and the others were speedily evacuated since ypres one is inclined to forget that there are any dangers about here but a couple of incidents have soon given us a reminder a close friend of mine and an old pupil at the rotunda has just died of his wounds he was with his regiment near me at ypres the man who replaced me with the highland infantry had a narrow escape on his first day a piece of shrapnel went through his cap and another gave him a nasty bruise on the side his orderly was killed by his side the highland light infantry are a very unlucky regiment for medical officers and i got out well for the period i was with them my days up at the trenches are numbered at present the colonel is keeping me at headquarters to run the show and the other fellows go out it is a compliment and one should be satisfied but one is always hankering for the more exciting visits to the aid posts however any day may bring a surprise and one really does not know what is in the future twenty seventh of may nineteen fifteen the australian contingents have been doing great work and their losses have been heavy but my own division alone in these few days at ypres lost more than the australians up to date and since then we have been bled very badly the casualties this month reached a figure which would surprise you if i mentioned it but the germans have also suffered we know they have drawn on their nineteen sixteen class and also called out the oldest men from the landstrom with italy in and a new stretch of frontier to guard even though passively they will feel the drain we have still to bring up k's millions and the french have not used their nineteen fifteen class since i wrote last i am again up at the trenches with another regiment the fourth king's liverpool territorial replacing their medico who is on sick leave apparently i am being kept as a sort of general utility man ready for any job when required when i was appointed to the regiment they were in the trenches where we lately broke through it is in the area i did so thoroughly early in the year going up by motor ambulance we just missed a high explosive at one crossroad we saw everybody running for shelter and guessed the reason and soon smelled it i had not been here since the memorable nerve chapelle action and how battered it now looked i found the brigadier in the old aid post to which i used to sprint so hard it was badly damaged and hardly recognizable after finding out my regiment's whereabouts i walked over to it my aid post was about three hundred yards behind the firing line as the regiment was coming out that evening i had little to do it was interesting however to watch the shells coming over especially the coal boxes the enemy spotted the reliefs taking over and they shelled the trenches very vigorously with shrapnel and pipsqueaks the latter are three-inch high explosives fired with a very flat trajectory and give no warning of their approach our billets are still within shell range and one company was billeted alongside a good old grandmother the one which i told you about recently the gun is carried in three sections and requires five traction engines of one hundred and sixty horsepower each the shell is a monster four and a half feet high and weighing about one thousand four hundred and sixty pounds thirteen hundred weight it is naturally only used for a definite object and always has an aeroplane up to observe the shot nearby were two anti-aircraft guns i have been talking to several airmen and they all tell me that the germans go very near them with their shrapnel in the early days of the war it was easy work as the germans were very bad shots however they have improved tremendously and our men have a very warm time whenever they go up one man put up a record last week eighteen shots perforated his planes i saw several thrilling sights in the last few days our plucky fellows just going on with shrapnel bursting all around them during two days rest i was busy getting my department up to date 
A territorial regiment is different from a regular battalion. Then we came up again, and so far I've had a quiet time, but one never knows when it may change. Yesterday I went through all the trenches right up to the advanced ones to make a sanitary inspection. Coming back I was pestered by three snipers, and that part of the journey was not pleasant. Bullets buzzed by me like flies, and I was not at all happy. End of section 8 Section 9 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 31st of May, 1915. Reading your letters, with the note of drought and heat, sounds familiar. We are having very close, muggy weather now, with multitudes of flies, and the water question has become serious. The nights at present are very cold. Since I last wrote, I have been up in the trenches once more, and am now back again resting. This latter term is rather a misnomer, as we have had two alarms already, and we never know when we may have to go up. The Lahore Division has had a very hard time lately. Since Ypres they have been on the go all the time, in the trenches and then out for one or two days, then back again, bearing the brunt of attack with heavy losses, sandwiched with periods of trench work. The men are dead tired, and badly want a proper rest. This will soon come, and meanwhile we must just do our bit, while the new armies are concentrated elsewhere for another push. After we left our billets, we soon got on the main Labassi road. The most of it is in our hands, but part is German, and they have the range accurately of the rest. I found my aid post was the last house before the trenches. It was a very roomy place, and held three aid posts, besides a regimental headquarters. The latter was a distinct injustice to the medicos. The Germans always search for headquarters and shell them heavily. But worse was to come, for the colonel cleaned up the place and then burnt the refuse. Imagine a fire within three hundred yards of the trenches. Luckily, a heavy wind was blowing, and no smoke ascended. Also, no taubers came over, but we expected to be crumped any time. I actually had my room decorated with flowers picked in the fields, hawthorn, poppies, and cornflowers. They reposed in empty shell cases. I slept on a little straw with my Burberry as blanket and my knapsack as a pillow. Of course, I was fully dressed all the time. I fared very simply, though well, on rations. One day I had a regular treat with the regiment in the same building. This rose to curry and rice and pudding. There was an old dog which had not deserted the farm, and we were soon firm friends. She slept beside me every night and was always about at mealtimes. A fair amount of shelling took place every day, big and little, but it always missed us, thank goodness. The days were extremely hot at first, but then got very cold, especially at night. Apparently they get extremes in this part of the country. One had little to do all day but just lolling about and reading. Often it was difficult to realise one was so near the firing line. The hot, glaring road and dead silence, broken now and then by shells and rifle fire. At night the roads were thick with ration parties and reliefs. But the Germans never shelled them. There is a more or less tacit agreement to allow rations up unmolested. If they shelled us, we would retaliate on them. However, snipers have a free hand, as I was soon to find out. I often went for short walks up the road, and kept an ear open for any shells which seemed near. My companion was usually a very tough nut in the IMS, an Irishman. He was arrested one evening as a spy, and had quite an exciting time. Nearby was a big house, known locally as the Doll's House. It had been hit twenty-six times by shells, and we spent an interesting half-hour inspecting it. Coming away, we agreed that a cellar was more a death-trap than anything else. If a big crump lands on one, it is all up. We have just got orders to move to a new area. 2nd of June, 1915. This part of the line is very strong. Both sides have tried unsuccessfully to break through, and both have failed. So I suspect the Germans are not holding the line with more men than necessary, like ourselves. A few machine guns take the place of hundreds of men. Meanwhile, concentrations are occurring elsewhere, and I own we should be getting the benefit of them. The outstanding part of my last visit to the trenches was the tour I made of our section. Medical officers are forbidden to go into the trenches unless under special orders from a superior officer. I, in conjunction with other medicos, was ordered one day to make a report on the sanitation of the trenches and surroundings. It will be no breach if I tell you now that I was going to Nerve Chapelle. Previously everything had looked green and nice, though there were ruins everywhere. I had now come into an area of desolation where everything was ruined and upset, where even the trees were simply shattered stumps and where the vegetation was not profuse. You will remember that at the battle in March we subjected this area to a very intense bombardment, and I now saw the result. 
on both sides of the road were trenches, the old ones now disused. The ground was cut up by them in all directions, and what was not trench was a vast graveyard, for at least fifteen thousand dead have been buried here. I soon passed the corner where a road ran on to the main one, and down which our men came during the fight. When they reached the main road they were met by terrific fire, and here most of the losses occurred. Now it looks innocent enough, just a narrow road and a few ruins where houses had been, but in March it was named the Gate of Hell. I then left the main road and walked up toward the remains of Neuve Chapelle. It was a fair-sized village. Now there are some pieces of the walls of the church standing and nothing more. It is an object lesson in modern artillery fire. Up to this I had not seen a soul. The country seemed absolutely desolate and most depressing, but near me were hundreds of men in their burrows. I soon came to the colonel's dugout and hastily got under cover as a sniper nearby was making things unpleasant. After a chat I set out with a guide for the front trenches. I may say that these trenches were originally ours last October, and then German, and once more our own. The Germans improved them immensely, and they were veritable palaces. Some day when I have the blues I shall tell you some of the things the Germans excel us at. The communication trench ran about half a mile up through the ruins of Neuve Chapelle. It was very sinuous, and the sides were not high, about four feet. So one did not feel very safe, even when bending. It was quite dry, and the dugouts along it very cosy and strong. There were odd remnants of German equipment and pumps all along it, and there was an awful stench. Outside was marshy land with a small stream, and here were lying hundreds of corpses. I saw one German who had been there for months, and he certainly was not a pleasant object with his back above water. We are gradually at night getting these corpses buried. The main trenches rather surprised me. They are wide enough to let two past, and then there was a raised platform, and above this a high parapet of sandbags. The men on duty stood on the shelf. The trenches were broken up every few yards by traverses to prevent any enfilade fire by machine guns. I did not look over at the Germans, as I don't want especially to figure on the roll of honour, but I had to go out of them behind to reach the latrines, and this part of the journey was not pleasant. Bullets were thudding against the sandbags all the time. After my inspection, I sat in the Major's dugout and had a yarn. Night came on and the flares went up, and how bright they made everything. While I was there, some shrapnel and pipsqueaks were sent over us, but no damage was done. The return journey was much more lively. After leaving the trenches and getting on the main road by moonlight, snipers began to make things busy. One gentleman had got well behind our lines and on the opposite side of the road. He opened fire at me about one hundred yards away, and I could see the flash distinctly. Then from the far end of the road, a maxim began to pot shots straight up. Between them I was having a pretty lively time, when two more began to shoot across the road. It was getting pretty warm by this, and the bullets fairly whizzed by me. However, I decided just to keep straight on and not lie down. I breathed a sigh freely when I reached the barricade. But no sooner was I passed when another blighter began, but he had no more luck than the others. Here snipers are a great pest. They crawl behind our lines or in front of them, and lie in ruins. After they have used up their supplies, they surrender. Later on when we advance, we fully expect to have to deal with many more, and especially with maxims up trees. Here is an absolutely true story of a sniper on this same road near where I was. Some Gurkhas were coming along, and one of them was sniped. The rest spread out and caught the Hun, dressed in khaki. They made him dig his grave, and then standing him alongside threw bombs at him. Two did the trick. The sniper certainly deserves all he gets. 6th of June, 1915 I came back to the ambulance a couple of days ago, and we are now in a big town with the luxury of a bed and a bath. However, I haven't used any sheets yet. I am too attached to my old flea bag to want to change. Asquith was over this week and reviewed the troops. Tonight I saw the first of Kitchener's army passing down to a hot spot on the line. They looked a very fine lot, and it is pleasant to see new blood coming out to give us old stages a hand. We need it. 12th of June, 1915 We have seen three of Kitchener's divisions, and they look very fine. But so far they have not been put into the trenches. We are now in a big town, in a fine chateau with a bath and a fountain in the garden. I am in charge of all the patients, surgical and medical, so I am kept busy all day long. I sleep on the premises every second night, being on duty for emergency cases. The weather is very close and sultry. A few days ago we had heavy thunderstorms, and these cleared the air a bit. Still, this is only a foretaste of what we shall get in July and August, and evidently we are in for a very torrid time. As a result, the number of admissions for sickness is rather high. The warm weather is causing every man who has had malaria to have recurrences, and there is an epidemic very like dengue fever. 
but if our men get a decent rest i think a lot of this will disappear the changes in the indian corps which i mentioned in my last have not taken place and we are all relieved but we have lost our colonel who has gone to an ambulance in kitchener's army he was a very fine type and we were sorry to lose him leave has been opened again for those requiring a rest for their health i am afraid i shall not be able to get away on that plea for i certainly look fit enough there are indications that soon we shall be using similar weapons to the hun i cannot tell you yet what gas we shall use but i rather imagine it will not be as brutal as chlorine more's the pity we have also petrol bombs to show you what we are expecting we have now testing cases for poisons in water we know quite well what they will do and it is good to know we shall fight them on equal terms it is no use talking about fighting with clean hands that won't defeat gas fumes i think the very worst blot on the germans is the way they fire on the wounded and prevent them being removed why we rescue them beats one and it would be better to leave them to die this war is not making us any better and soon we shall begin to think of letting all their wounded die they don't deserve much better treatment twenty second of june nineteen fifteen at present my job is to look after all the sick and wounded this keeps me about the place most of the day a ride on my horse in the afternoon is about the extent of my recreation on several days i have gone grave hunting with the padre he is registering all graves we have frequented spots which are usually pretty warm but so far no shell has burst too near us our troops made an attack down at festubert early in the week it was partially successful on our front we made a feint just to keep the huns busy they got busy on us also and sent plenty of bombs over however our casualties were light lately i have seen a good number of cases of shock caused by shells bursting near men the poor fellows are in a bad way shortly afterwards most of them are deaf and often partially blinded by the flash and the explosion they are quite dazed and pitiable objects one poor boy had only been up for a week and he was a complete nervous wreck it is a wonder how they stand the sight so well one of the surgical consultants visited us during the week a leading aberdeen surgeon it was a treat to speak to him and to learn of the latest methods at the base one knows so little here of what the men at the base do up to this iodine has been used practically for all wounds we had been experimenting with formalin two per cent in spirit but from exhaustive experiments in bologna by leading bacteriologists a much simpler treatment has been evolved and is giving much better results also a five per cent solution of salt with citrate of soda is the dressing for all wounds tabloids of this are put in any holes in addition the principle roughly is that all the usual chemical disinfectants kill the tissues as well as the organisms and so locally lower the power of the tissues to kill off germs still alive but by using a saline solution it tends to make more lymph flow into the wound and with it the white corpuscles or phagocytes which eat up the germs the tissue is not killed and so one endeavours to combat infection by stimulating the natural resources of the body and not by partially or wholly killing the tissues immediately round the injury while other methods may prove more successful in wounds in civil life i believe this simple method will turn out to be a great discovery for war wounds lately we have had a series of cases of kidney trouble of a very obscure origin nearly every one has occurred with artillerymen and we cannot find out the reason as i have had all the cases in this division i have been asked to investigate just at present i cannot go to the batteries specially affected as the huns have been shelling them vigorously but soon i hope to try and find out the cause we have had great fun recently with our indians watching them wrestle in the indian style we challenged another ambulance and put up a franc prize with the winners for each round the natives got to with a will and we spectators enjoyed the fun they stripped all except a loincloth and the wrestling seems to be a mixture of jiu-jitsu and english methods end of section nine section ten of war letters from a young queenslander by robert marshall allen this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty eighth of june nineteen fifteen referring to the landing of the australians at gallipoli well may you be proud of the way the australians landed it seemed an impossible thing to do and how they did it makes one wonder that feat will rank high after this war things are quiet on our front the hun is holding his line with many machine guns and few men an awful carnage is going on with the french at Suchet. they have got a move on and probably this will be where the line will ultimately be broken the indian corps has taken over a bigger piece of the line this is welcome news because it means that we shall not be pushing we want a rest badly 
The chief interest for me since I last wrote has been my investigations into the outbreak of nephritis among the gunners. I went to all the batteries implicated, but as I expected I did not find any obvious cause for the trouble. The men were all healthy, the cooking pots did not promise to provide any clues, and while water was drunk without being boiled, still very little was used. However, I took samples of both beer and water. These I took to St. Omer, to the analyst. It was a fine joy ride over undulating country, and quite a treat to get to a town with shops, and life more like what it is in normal times. You have to get a pass to get in or out of the town. It is built on very hilly country, and has several big churches. One was being used as a garage, and on top of another was an anti-aircraft gun, and yet we curse the Hun for destroying churches. The laboratory was quite interesting, for they were testing fragments of German shells and doing experiments regarding a gas for us. I believe our variety is to be pretty good. I saw the apparatus each German soldier wears against the use of gas by us. It consists of a piece of cotton waste and a bottle of acetic acid. All our men are armed with respirators and smoke helmets with a talc window, both soaked in a solution of soda and hypo. For the last few weeks I have been on constant duty in the hospital, and have been working very hard. I hope to get away on leave soon. 3rd of July, 1915. At last we are having Australian weather conditions. It has been an extremely hot day, and I expect we shall end up with a thunderstorm. Meanwhile we are tormented by smells, though not to the same extent as the boys in the trenches. Fancy rooting with your stick among a heap and dislodging old Huns dead for months. But the mosquitoes and midges are the limit. They give the most venomous bite. In the old days I did not react to bites, but here I raise fine lumps and had to foment my elbow for three days to reduce the swelling. The hot weather has caused all the men with malaria to have relapses. Unfortunately, the malaria-carrying mosquito exists here, and we may yet leave a legacy behind us which will be difficult to eradicate. We have had a fairly busy month, putting through our hands over 1,000 cases, mostly sick. I had to do with them all, classifying and treating them. It was good to hear, as we did lately, that the clearing station stated that our transfer certificates were the ones they valued the most, as they were always accurate in every detail and gave the fullest information. That praise goes to my assistants mainly, for they are willing helpers. I had a very interesting talk with a Durham miner the other day. His accent was rather hard to follow, but he gave me an account of how a sap was made. They dug down 30 feet, and then towards the enemy trenches for 300 feet. The sap was about 4.5 feet by 3 feet when timbered. The air was circulated by a pump. They heard the Germans above them busy making a counter sap, and managed to blow theirs up first. He concluded, you should have heard them squeal like pigs. Aeroplanes have been very active on both sides lately, and as a result shelling has been vigorous. We fully expect that when the Russians are pushed back sufficiently, we shall get the benefit of the big guns in earnest. Kind and pessimistic friends inform us of the existence of 12-inch guns at Lille, with a 20-mile radius which are going to reduce our present billets. They advise us to clear out soon. I rather suspect they want the billets. But there is no reason why this town should not have been damaged long ago. There is an old French vet living in my billet. The other day he got hold of a copy of the Australasian, and saw some advertisement for veterinary instruments. These so interested him that I was instructed to write and ask for a catalogue. Referring to certain reports, the writer says, The Hun only appreciates what he does to others, and a repetition of that medicine usually quiets him. I believe the French are fighting with a terrible ferocity. They all carry long knives, and in close combat such as this trench warfare is, the knife, and not the bayonet, is the weapon. Extermination is the best way to beat the Hun, and not making him a prisoner and pampering him. 15th of July, 1915. We travelled via Bologna. There was a special boat for us, about 1,000 all told, and we did the channel trip in quick time. So far, no submarine has caught a mailboat. The passage is practically walled off on each side by torpedo nets. I believe this is the chief way we have of catching the submarine. We got to London at 5 a.m. I went to a hotel and soaked in a hot bath for an hour, and then caught the early train for here. There is little change in Dublin. One is struck by the apparent indifference of the people here to the war. The mean little intrigues and squabbles are going on as of yore. The streets are full of young men in mufti. One feels like praying to got to struff them. I only wish the Hun would come over here and waken them up. The Germans dread another winter worse than us, and they are likely to make a supreme effort very soon. This is just what we want, for it will be easier to slaughter them than to be slaughtered. 
At present all the Indian troops are out of the line, and are being rested until they are required. With all the new troops they can now be spared. Recruiting seems to be very brisk in Australia just now, and well might it be to cheer the lads who have done so well. 25th of July, 1915 For the first week after leave, one always feels liverish, and inclined to grouse at anything. It is hard to settle down again. Leave unsettles the men also, for they see their pals comfortable at home and earning anything from six pounds a week upwards. It seems hard that they are out here risking everything. So far every three months has some new surprise or job for me. In the first it was the baths, during the second the memorable march to Ypres, and I was wondering what this one would produce. I hadn't long to wait, for I soon got my orders to join a brigade of artillery, vice a man who went down sick. The job is only temporary, for my ambulance won't part with me. It is meant as a compliment, but I often wish I could be left at a new job for some time. My duties are not heavy. I live at headquarters and have three batteries to look after, plus the wagon lines and the ammunition column behind us. Being an Indian command, I have an assistant surgeon under me, and not RAMC orderlies, as in the British regiments. These assistant surgeons are Eurasians, and have passed a full medical course, so they can be trusted to work absolutely alone. There is one to each battery, and I only call round every other day or so, and see any special cases. Two of the three batteries are quiet enough. The Hun leaves them alone, but the one nearest us gets more than its proper share of hate. Just behind these are batteries of 4.7 and 60 pounder guns, and these annoy the Bosch very much. My battery lies between them, and acting as referee gets all the hard knocks. The German shooting is very accurate, and they have made the main road past here pretty dangerous. 8 inch and 5.9 and 4.2 came over at odd times all day long. They landed about 200 yards from here. Still we go out and watch the results, and never mind, though we are still within the range. I have to go across fields to reach the battery, and only use the road at odd times. Today I got a reminder when I saw a big splash of blood and a cap on it. It is interesting to see the gunners working, and from reports they fairly make the Huns sit up. The weather has been unsettled lately, and for several days the roads resembled those of last winter, and next too, I suppose. Every night we watch the aeroplanes and the shells bursting round them. The shells are pretty active at present. We see at least six aviatics every day, and there are always fixed balloons up. They won't be caught napping again as at Neuve Chapelle. Meanwhile the summer glides by and we remain stationary. It is very galling, but the Hun has us securely and we cannot break through on our front. However, there are signs that something is in the wind in a new quarter altogether. Opposite our house is a small graveyard, which makes one reflect. It consists of six graves, three British and three German, men who had fallen last October. The writer here indicates that this silent plot had previously been in German possession, and that they had put up better crosses over their own dead. These Germans were Uhlans, and one has an inscription, apparently copied from the original, that he had died a hero's death from an aeroplane bomb. The graves are beautifully kept, and the men here have put stone crosses over each, and a big R.I.P. 1914. That sentiment represented our feelings towards the enemy until the end of winter. Now it is all changed. The total disregard of all rules and the use of gas has altered us. They may sing their hymn of hate, but the ordinary Tommy has a hate too. No German gets any consideration now. He is going to be killed and not taken prisoner, and they have only themselves to blame. We played fair, and they did not respond. One knows what happens to men between the trenches. The slightest movement means a shower of rifle and machine-gun bullets. Not content with that, they spray the wounded and then set fire to them, and incendiary bullets are used on those out of reach of the spray. I have spoken to officers who have seen all this and the charred remains. Yet they have the effrontery to fly a Red Cross flag over a building in La Basse. You may be sure no medical work is going on there, but we have respected it so far. Such conduct recoils on them, for we can also kill and do so. A wounded Hun does not get much consideration now, and the unwounded variety just gets his puddin stirred up, as a jock told me. Here are some spy incidents. When this brigade went up to Ypres, one battery went to a farm where the people cleared out that night. The next day they were heavily shelled and had to retire. When going, they found that a large white door had been placed in a field as a guide to the aeroplanes. In the farm where the headquarters were was a nice green patch, and the farmer had dug a curious L-shaped drain across it. Our fellows promptly dug up the whole place. Recently we have seen carrier pigeons fly from near here, and possibly that is why our battery is being so heavily shelled, but we cannot expect much else until we clear the civil population much further back. 
The flies are an awful pest at present, and much worse than Australia. At night the mosquitoes fairly make one think of home sweet home. 3rd of August, 1915. I am now back again in the field ambulance. As leave was open and we were understaffed, I was recalled. It was a nice week's rest, but too slow to last me forever. Still, I had a very near call this week, and was taught a lesson I hardly need about the uncertainties of life up here. Near where we were billeted was a lot of heavy guns, and the Hun gets very annoyed when they fire. It always makes him retaliate, and with heavy stuff too. One part of the road is absolutely unsafe when the Bosch is at work. Nearly every shell hits it. I have to go past here, but usually make a detour through the fields. One day I was out, when a shot reached one of the batteries and laid out eight men. Three days ago I went to one of our batteries to see some model dugouts, and was returning by the fields when the evening hate began. An eight-inch Jack Johnson landed about two hundred yards away, and I stood watching it when I heard a very loud hum approaching me. I lay down quickly, and a huge fragment dropped less than ten yards away. The range of these big shells is pretty wide, and one is not safe from fragments for several minutes later. At this same battery a man was wounded by a machine-gun bullet fired from the German trenches nearly two miles away. They had been firing up in the air at one of our aeroplanes. Yesterday we were shocked at a terrible accident on this same bit of road. I had been down at my batteries which were sheltered out of range, but when returning as usual across the fields I noticed something was wrong at a corner where all the shells land, and hurried up to be of any possible use. A staff officer had been passing along in his car when one of the shells landed absolutely on it. The driver was blown headless twenty-five yards along the road, and the officer was in the ditch with half his face blown away and unrecognisable. The car was in pieces. It was a sickening sight. Curiously, both men left their feet in the car. The shock of the explosion must have been awful. One rather delights to see Huns hurtling through the air when a big shell bursts, but it is another thing to lose friends. The young officer was our chief postmaster, and if ever one had a safe billet, one would have thought he had. I think this accident will make the cause close this section of the road when shelling is on. There is one patch about ten yards square, with five direct hits of eight-inch shell. The Hun has been helped to find the range by spies, and I was glad to see a few of them being marched in recently. They included a woman. We have a lot of refugees and Frenchmen working for us in a labour corps. They build trenches in the rear positions. One of them was killed recently, and they took the corpse in an open motor back to the town where his wife was. An unfortunate Belgian had to sit by the body and hold it up, and he naturally was the colour of the corpse itself. One is used to death in various forms by this, but still it was a gruesome ride, and what a homecoming. 9th of August, 1915 I have been depressed this week over the latest casualty lists. My first regiment at Aldershot, 9th King's Royal Rifle Corps, came out at the end of May. They went to Hooge, and it was their first time in the trenches. They got the liquid fire and the list contains most of their officers. The colonel was killed. He was a sahib, as the Anglo-Indian phrase has it. My best friends among the junior officers were also killed, all young fellows, fresh from the school or the varsity. I had wished that my old regiment could have had a better start, but now the remains will have to go on. The week has been fairly uneventful, though a few bullets nearly found a billet in me. Being back in the ambulance, I have gone on outside work with the bearer section. This was my original job, and I was always hankering after it, even though I don't relish bullets more than anyone else. I have been acting this week as a kind of cook's guide to men from the ambulances just out with the new K division. They have been training for a long time at home and were full of theory. They soon found out that the actual thing differed somewhat from what they had learned. I took out parties of three, and thoroughly enjoyed myself watching them duck to the bullets and lie flat when a flare went up. Do not imagine I am reckless, but after some experience one automatically knows when extra care is needed. But of course, a stray bullet may come at any time. In the last lot that were here were a couple of Australians who had come over with the hundred volunteers. They were both Sydney men, and I had the luxury of a good long yarn with them. End of section 10 Section 11 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 16th of August, 1915. Things remain in status quo here, and are likely to do so. Frankly, I do not see how it could be otherwise. Both sides have tried unsuccessfully to get through. The French made a very big push at Suchet. They reached the labyrinth after awful slaughter, but they did not get through. 
Now we are held up by a large number of machine guns, and probably about one million men along the whole western front. What good would it do to try and get through? Rather let them come on again if they want to, or else wait for developments elsewhere. Now that the enemy is threatening Serbia once more, I fancy matters will take a sudden change down there, and that the Balkan jackals will decide with which pack to hunt. We are now back in the country residence where we were before Neuve Chapelle. After two and a half months of luxurious existence in billets, we are now under canvas, but the change is good and we like it. The last few nights were, on the whole, quiet when collecting cases, though on one occasion both sides were rather peevish and the bullets came pretty close. Good old mother, 9.2 howitzer, chipped in, and it was grand to see the damage she could do, timber and sandbags and huns hurtling through the air. Our new high explosive is also something, and bursts with a crump quite equal to its German confrere. A couple of days ago, our Mohammedan natives had a great time at their festivities, the equivalent of our Lent. The last month has been Ramadan, during which they fasted and did not drink until sunset each day. They also made the air noisy with their prayers and recitations from the Koran. When the last night came, a message was sent from India, saying that the chief priest, or muezzin, had seen the new moon, and that the fast was over. The Indians dressed in white and careered round, embracing each other and making a great hullabaloo. Afterwards they had a feast of curried mutton and rice and spices. Sitting back here on a fine afternoon, it is hard to realise the war is on. At present the tints of the trees and the fields are beautiful. Harvesting is in full swing. In the majority of cases, old men and women and children are reaping. Occasionally a reaping machine can be seen. Nobody pays much, if any, attention to the aeroplanes overhead and the anti-aircraft shells. Even big shells landing in the fields do not disturb the harvesters unless they come very close. And this condition of intense cultivation goes right up to the front line. But then a change comes. The fields are still cultivated, but very ragged, because no sowing was done, naturally, last year. Grass grows luxuriantly all over the place. The change that is marked is in the condition of the trees and the houses. The woods here and on the La Basse Road, especially about Neuve Chapelle, are the essence of desolation. The trees are all gaunt and absolutely devoid of foliage. Many are just stumps with jagged ends, like a human arm or leg after the rest has been blown off. Others still have the upper half lying on one side. The houses are mere shells, the roofs are skeletons of rafters, walls mostly non-existent, or simply a mass of holes. In many cases all that remains of the house is a heap of bricks. Trenches run in all directions, and sandbag barricades block the roads. Nothing is visible during the day save clouds of dust as shells burst. At night the roads are dotted with parties coming and going. Star shells light everything up, and bullets whiz over, humming like blue bottles. Shell holes abound, and little graves and discarded provisions and kit. When the war is over, it will take time to obliterate this awful zone which exists from the sea to Switzerland. 23rd of August, 1915 our mails have been disorganised for a couple of days because a French mine got adrift after Boulogne and stopped all the traffic. We have had a peaceful week, just basking in what little sun there was, and going route marches and doing physical exercises to keep fit. One afternoon, when lying in my tent, I was astonished to hear a couple of bullets whiz very close. A Maxim was practising nearby, and we had the benefit of a couple of shots. We soon warned them to get the gun turned elsewhere. We have also been honoured by a captive balloon which goes up near us. The honour is rather dubious, as the Hun naturally tries to shell it, and a village about a mile away got all his attempts the other day. The majority of the troops now fighting against Russia will probably be too tired to be used as first-class cannon fodder on this side. Their guns too will require reboring, and so, if we have a push before the winter, we should be in a position to give them a hot time. Heavy guns continue to pour into us, and the reserve of ammunition is now not contemptible. However, one does not know what will occur. We have just got a new order to remove all cases from the aid post by daylight instead of at night. We have been appealing for this for a long time, but the higher officers, never having been out at night, did not see the need for it. They always visited the line by day, and then there are practically no bullets, only an occasional shell. At night, apart from the difficulty of finding one's way about in the dark, there are the ever-present stray bullets, not to mention an odd sniper. One does not mind going through a curtain of bullets if there was anything to be gained, but the clearance of cases can be managed much better in the day, and it is certainly safer for us. At present we are preparing for next winter in the ambulance. 30th of August, 1915 
since i last wrote i have been up in the trenches again with the connaught rangers replacing their medical officer on leave these temporary jobs are a welcome change i joined the regiment here about two hours before we marched up we took about two and a half hours and reached the front line at an advanced dressing station from there we took to the fields for about a mile and met a good many stray bullets i found my aid post was in a farm not too badly knocked about the brigade signallers had part of it while my share was a fine cellar with a dugout for myself the cellar had a brick roof with iron girders and above it was a loft full of dried beans quite a good buffer for any shell it was a matter of detail that in winter this same cellar usually holds about three feet of water let sleeping dogs lie we are still in summer my dugout was very low and too narrow still i had a stretcher for a bed and plenty of mice to keep me company later on i found that harvest bugs had also taken a toll of me and i am still suffering from their attentions it might easily have been worse i was lulled to sleep that night by the crackling of machine guns and rifles and odd bombs as trench mortars lobbed their shells over the next day was taken up in going into sanitary matters we now use empty tins for latrines and clean them thrice daily i was in the third line trenches with the reserve companies not far away was neuve chapelle the whitened remains of its church strongly resemble the bleached bones of some dead animal and stand out against the dark trees most of which are branchless and leafless stripped by the constant shrapnel fire a good communication trench took one to the regimental headquarters and support trenches about five hundred yards further on these were situated in the remains of a little village on a road now simply a collection of tireless rafters and riddled walls naturally everybody was in dugouts the whiz of snipers bullets was constant down here then one went on by plum street to the orchard in the front line about three hundred yards the trench here was much deeper and stronger and soon one reached the limit all the communication trenches have names the ones in this part all led to an orchard and are called peach plum apple and mole other parts of the line rejoice in old familiar names bond street oxford street leicester lounge piccadilly etc these names are official and very confusing unless you know them naturally they do not figure on the ordinary map likely to fall into hostile hands the particular front held by the connaughts had very good fire trenches high and solidly built the hun was only about fifty yards away at this place so any movement soon brought over an inquiring bullet i had a good look at the opposite side with a periscope all one could see was a long white parapet between the two trenches was no man's land composed of fields absolutely bare all the grass had been cut down and a few gaunt trees not a bit of life could be seen except occasional shovelfuls of earth thrown over the hun parapet by a working party but though nobody seemed to be watching the thud of bullets on the parapet showed that the german was awake down there is the advance trench with a similar one opposite you and the chance of death at any moment makes one think a lot but the holders of the front line did not seem to worry much about such a curious way of spending life one man was on guard in each traverse and watched for any movements the rest sprawled about asleep or sat in dugouts reading writing or playing cards the cares and anxieties here are chiefly borne by the officers usually by the junior ones and they do not have much time to themselves in the blazing sun the narrow trenches were extremely hot soon they'll be quagmires for the most of the week i was there i had little to do in the day except watching the aeroplanes being shelled and looking out for any shells coming our way but the hun was very quiet and reserved his hate for the trenches a very interesting entente occurred in the trenches next to us when i was with the connaughts one evening an officer was playing his gramophone in his dugout when a request was shouted over to play some ragtime he did so and then the hun officer asked him to put the instrument on the parapet promising not to shoot at it this was done to the satisfaction of both sides the hun then suggested that the two officers should meet halfway unarmed they did so and meanwhile the men sat up on the parapet and smoked the first question the hun asked was have you any men from the trocadero apparently some of his men were there before the war the german staff however look with great disfavour on these ententes they want hate all the time when the time comes our men will show enough of it it is almost unnecessary to say that the men opposite us are saxons the only decent hun in the last afternoon when the evening hate was at its height i got an urgent message to come to the front line our shells were coming over very low and made one duck involuntarily and the return pipsqueaks and bombs pretty thick and near however nothing happened though i had to hug the trench several times to avoid fragments they wanted me to see a poor fellow who had been shot through the head to decide whether he should be left there to die or whether i could give him a better chance by taking him back 
there he lay in pools of blood in a narrow trench in the remnants of an orchard on a fine evening and high explosives were whizzing over us all the time and possibly going to land a few more of us in the same condition it was not a nice sight but the realities of war are not poetic at night i visited a neighboring dugout and played bridge with the officers it was highly dangerous to walk about in the open because of the bullets and yet until lately we had to do this nightly to collect wounded one did not appreciate it so much until he sat there night after night and heard the whines of the high ones and the swish of those landing near him while i was there a new bomb thrower came up a modern catapult engine it was a beauty and we practised with bricks and apples at all passers-by one of these was a major of the connaughts and he was rather angry when a half brick lobbed near him these are just some odd jottings of a quiet week in the trenches but soon all will be changed this inactivity is nearly at an end and long before this reaches you hell will have broken loose for our great attack so long planned is about to take place may i come through it as before seventh of september nineteen fifteen i have just had a week in charge of the divisional train whose doctor was on leave the train consists of four companies of the a s c who supply the various brigades naturally they were scattered and it took a good four hours ride to get round them all the ride however kept me in good form several of the days were very wet but the last couple have been brilliant and quite made up for the wetting that i then received as the ambulance is resting things have been quiet the only excitement has been aerial i told you before about the captive sausage balloon above us it was sure to attract the attention of the hun who eventually had a few shots which fell about a mile short the other morning we saw a hun biplane come over disregarding all our archibald shells and sail right round the unfortunate balloon luckily it did not fire on it yesterday we saw an aerial duel the hun had a machine gun and forced our man to retire and come down wounded not content with bringing gas to this front the hun has also presented us with his battle plane or super aeroplane this monster was out over us on sunday it measures sixty to seventy feet across and has two sets of engines it is very fast and must be a terror to meet up in the air it had the cheek to come over and fire with the machine gun on our trenches however cheer up i have just read about the wonderful aeroplanes we are about to use though usually last in the field with anything new we are said to have the limit now a plane capable of doing one hundred and fifty eight miles an hour i got a couple of footballs for our personnel british and native and already they have given a lot of pleasure it makes time pass more quickly and makes them a lot cheerier it does make one laugh to see the natives playing the majority know nothing of the game but they play with plenty of noise and vigour with their long stick-like legs the hair done up in a knot on their heads six or just a little pigtail they look very picturesque the havildar or sergeant is referee and he imports his authority onto the field the penalty for handling the ball is a clout from the referee and to be chased off the field that rule works wonders we hope to have a gramophone for next winter and to get up a penny whistle band and so pass away the long dreary hours of darkness i am keeping very fit with a run every morning and then physical exercises followed by a cold tub in the open eighth of september nineteen fifteen referring to letters surmising that he was in a fine chateau the writer says i was very amused at your thinking that my chateau was an old medieval structure as a matter of fact it is a modern house attached to a glucose factory which stank like pinkumber this part of france does not abound in old mansions it is too industrial about six miles off is bethune the new castle of the north of france and the centre of all the coal mines while we have two mines here the country is quite flat and covered with crops harvesting has finished and the farmers are hard at work ploughing the fields again they don't mean to waste any time all the labour is done by old men and women and children not to mention the poor decrepit horses many a poor brute who should have finished his days in peace has now to do a very heavy day's work i don't think anything has surprised the indians more than the reapers and binders in india everything connected with agriculture is very primitive and the men looked agape at the machines so common to us i know that some of the more wealthy have written for catalogues for future use you may not know that practically every soldier aspires to be a landowner if even it may mean a small plot after serving their time they get a grant of land so all this intensive cultivation has a great interest for them End of section 11
Section twelve of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In this letter, written on the anniversary of his entering Aldershot, the writer reviews his experiences of the year more fully referred to in previous letters. 11th of September, 1915. What a contrast with this day a year ago. After fretting for a month, I was at last called up. I had left the rotunda with the hearty wishes of those who had worked with me for three years. I was off to an unknown world, and with about a dozen other freshers, we entered the army portals at Aldershot. We were very raw, and did not know what to do or where to go. We drove to the wrong place first, and finally ended up at the RAMC depot, where a kindly colonel welcomed us. Some men went to the hospitals, but I thank my stars now that I got a regiment. I shall not forget the six long miles ride in a decrepit cab to Blackdown, an elevation in the wilds of Hampshire overlooking the Bisley Range. It was late when I arrived, but a warm welcome was waiting me from the colonel of the Ninth King's Royal Rifles, a sahib as I was to learn soon. Those were the days when the men poured into Kitchener's army, and when the organisation was more absent than present. All honour to those who came forward then and suffered great discomforts for their country. Here was I, miles away from anywhere, dumped down to look after five thousand men. Nobody to help me, to give me any details of army methods, so I just had to plug ahead and do my best. Of course, I had a great pull after the rotunda, three years of teaching, of learning to meet emergencies quickly and solve them at once, before keenly observant people. All these are bound to leave their mark. Apart from my own work, there was very much to be learnt, watching the small number of officers licking the raw material into shape. They were willing to learn, and even my attempts to help them in details such as the care of the feet were warmly welcomed. Then came the appeals for men to be inoculated. The majority were wise, but there were many foolish virgins, and they took a lot of persuading. The time went quickly, and I began to hunger for more active service. Unloading trains of wounded made one wish to be off and abroad. The chance came, and I took it. I shall never forget my farewell to my first regiment. The colonel said good-bye, and then called for three cheers for their first M.O. He was a thorough English gentleman, in the fullest sense of the word, and died in the first battle his men experienced, the liquid fire attack at Hooge. Still, he had the great joy of leading the men he had trained from raw cubs into an ordeal quite different from any of his previous fights. May his spirit rest in peace, and I am glad I served under him. One left England with mingled feelings. It was not like the usual method of travelling to the continent. The patrols in the channel and the precautions were strange. Eventually, after cruising round, we landed at Bologna, and once more I was fully trusted by my O.C. The first days of getting number 14 stationary hospital into order were nightmares, but everybody worked hard and the deed was done. Then came two and a half months hard work, but pleasant. When you have your superiors behind you all the time, life is worth living. Like a recurrent fever, once more the attack came on me, and I wanted to penetrate into that fog beyond which was the mysterious region called the Front. While at Bologna it was difficult to get up to where the war really was. Finally I was off in a slow train, and was dumped out next morning with my first glimpses of Indians. Soon I reached my ambulance, and have been off and on with it ever since. Immediately we went into action, I was sent out to form an advanced dressing station, again with no instructions, and only the vaguest notion as to what I was to do. I got my baptism of fire right enough, and soon learnt a few of the mysteries of war. The winter and all its discomforts are far behind us now, but a fresh one looms up. One knows what to expect, even though it is not very welcome. The time until spring was enlivened by my extra jobs as O.C. Baths and O.C. Wash House, the latter was really very funny, though extremely strenuous, and I have more respect now for the washer lady. I got a week with the Connaught Rangers, and then came Nerve Chapelle and Ypres with the Highland Light Infantry. That fairly initiated me into all the horrors of war. Since then I have had odd regimental jobs and routine with the ambulance. Something new seems to come in my way every three months, and I am waiting now for the next one. One is often asked what one's feelings are under fire. It is not pleasant, but if you are working hard you don't mind. The roar of the shells is rather disquieting, but the swish and ping of bullets still makes one duck. I have never got used to them absolutely, and neither has the average man if he tells the truth. The more brain development a man possesses, the less he gets accustomed to war. The average Tommy does not mind in the least, but I have seen an officer who ran a special risk have his hair turned grey in a week from worry. 
the life is rough at the front and death is very near all the time and at very unexpected moments but one gets used to it all and more or less takes life as it comes to one working hard the best part of it all is the confidence of your senior officers once you have earned it i am in the happy position of being desired by three regiments their o c s have asked for me and want me back it's enough to turn my head but i trust you will understand the spirit in which this is written i have given my best to the work and the reward is sweet now i have been promoted to captain after a year's service i am no longer a raw recruit but fully fledged in all the grim work of war i am sitting in an orchard watching the guns shooting at aeroplanes and everything seems so peaceful but at any moment i may be called to those blasted roads and fields to do my duty and the call is coming soon the work at the rotunda seems to belong to another period and my fingers must certainly have lost their cunning to a large extent but i wouldn't have lost this chance of serving my country it has been a hard apprenticeship but it has done me good in many ways at present i am fitter than i have ever been before sunburnt and full of life i may not come through this war but i have no regrets so far pardon the egotistical view of this letter but one is tempted to digress on the anniversary of my joining the corps getting one's captaincy is like a graduation you cannot exactly describe one without having experienced the other fourteenth of september nineteen fifteen the weather began very badly for september and we had three days of the most wintry type now however it is very hot and the month will probably be a good one this should have some effect on the campaign at the present moment nothing seems to be happening on our front but the hun is getting very restless and anxious to know what our game is and especially where we mean to strafe him bombardments are going on daily and the german aeroplanes are much more active than before we get at least three or four daily well over our lines we too are rather restless for we all know that the big push is about to take place but the exact time and place are kept secret though one can guess at certain possibilities long before you get this we shall be through another hell and may i come through safely we lost an aeroplane a few weeks ago which fell into the german lines when our officer was speaking to the hun at the entente referred to in a recent letter the latter told him that both officers were dead and were given a military funeral we got our revenge the other evening when archibald popped off and hit an aviatic it was a sickening sight to see the plane slowly circling down and then finally plunge to earth the same day we saw one of the coolest acts of bravery seen in the war an aviatic was coming over our lines when it was hit by a shell on the left bottom plane the plane then inclined upward toward the other one the machine was lopsided and began to stagger and then turned turtle several times the observer got out and stood on the damaged plane to balance the machine eventually he lay down on it the pilot was then able to bring the machine down safely that man deserved the iron cross first class and we hope he will get it our men appreciate a brave deed and they did not fire on the plane but gave him a cheer in recognition of his feat the writer here refers to a handy manual or booklet which he had written at the request of the o c it gave practical hints to regimental doctors on first entering on active service in the field he had been highly complimented by his o c on this work he has sent a copy but it is official and for the present confidential he simply wrote down his own personal experience as a guide to others he says i have done a year's service and have graduated in the cause and been promoted this is my thesis and i have referred to nothing except what i actually did it will be a reference for those writing the medical side of the campaign nineteenth of september nineteen fifteen referring to letters from brisbane about the internment of germans the writer says no one can accuse me of having nothing but hate for the germans but after being out here and seeing what the devils can do one is almost in favour of shutting up the lot i know there are plenty in british possessions who are perfectly loyal but there are others especially in great britain and it is hard to pick them out the golden rule doesn't apply to the hun and he has not left any of our side free in germany at any rate our job here is to exterminate the breed and we are all keen on it things are still the same but events are moving quickly and i may be delayed in my next letters to you i expect to go to a regiment to-morrow or the next day for a fortnight that should cover a lot we are ready now for the signal and may it come soon in our reports we recently got an extract showing teutonic thoroughness the main dental paper stated that gold was no longer available for repairs and that most substances were scarce they had begun to extract the teeth from dead russians and use them from kitchener's last speech it seems as if conscription was coming nearer only the inner circle know exactly how we stand and if they want it then it must come it will do a lot of slackers good to be compelled to join and do something 
Yesterday I was over at a small town where a branch of the official canteens has been opened. The charges are most reasonable and duty-free. The men are all under military law. Grocers are dressed in khaki, but they have not lost their professional ways, especially in making out the bill. I had better give you a sketch of field work once more, as it has been modified somewhat since the winter. Then all aid posts were in houses about half a mile or so back. These have now ceased to exist largely. The medical officer lives in a dugout at the commencement of the communication trench to the front line. He is thus well up and gets a liberal share of anything in the way of hate which may be on at that time. The dugout is generally small and one cannot stand upright in it. One has a stretcher for a bed and possibly a chair if one can be secured. The roof is more or less thick, usually less, and will protect one from splinters, but if a shell, no matter what size, landed on it, there would be a vacancy in that regiment. At present these dugouts are quite dry, but in the winter they will be the limit. Rain will drip in and the floor will be more than moist. However, we may be elsewhere, or at least they may be made more watertight. The orderlies have another dugout, and the patients go there. In this division we also have Indians who take over the cases and conduct them back to the advanced dressing stations. We have two of these for our front, and they are worked by the field ambulance in turn. One consists of a good house well protected by trees. Because of the colour of the door, it is called the green barn. Here the facilities for looking after the cases are much more elaborate. The serious cases are redressed and placed in the motors which come up as far as this. It is well forward in the danger zone, and of course may be shelled at any time. The other post is composed solely of dugouts, because it is in a warm spot which the Hun dearly loves to strafe. Cases are not kept there for long, but sent straight to the field ambulance. Reserves of dressings are kept, and so when a regiment runs short, they can quickly get a fresh supply. In both places the transport of cases up from the aid post is facilitated by a light tramway. The men are placed on trucks and quickly pushed by hand. Naturally, the Hun knows of this line, and it is not a pleasant spot, especially at night time when the ration parties use it and bullets whiz over continuously. With the present trench warfare, the scheme of advanced dressing stations works very well. It prevents men being detained in aid posts all day and gets them rapidly out of the front zone. 22nd of September, 1915. I am under half an hour's notice to move up with another officer and our natives in reserve to the field ambulance already open. Our ambulance will stay back here and take sick only. If we break through, then our sections rejoin and the whole ambulance will push right on. I feel quite calm as befits an old war horse, but of course accidents may occur. The day before yesterday we had a surprise visit from Kitchener, who reviewed a brigade close to us. He was looking very fit and gave us a huge smile. We took it as a good omen that he has Kaiser Bill on the hop this time and won't let him go. As a matter of fact, we have one or two surprises for the Hun, but I must keep glum on them just now. The artillery have been hard at it for days, and the Hun front-line trenches should be very unhealthy spots. End of section 12 Section 13 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 29th of September, 1915. I cannot write much this time, as I am extremely busy. We are in the middle of the great fight, and are doing very well. It is cheering to know we are fairly strafing the Hun at last. I was up near Nerve Chapelle when our attack began. The guns made a great noise, and then we sprang a surprise on Fritz. He didn't like the gas one little bit either. But the main surprise was the use of smoke bombs. These emitted a dense white cloud, and prevented the enemy from seeing what we were up to. It is the first good trick we have not borrowed from the Hun. Our men made a feint and pierced three lines of trenches thought to be impregnable. But the attack was only a feint and then they withdrew. Down south, the first army is going great guns. We rejoined our unit last night and today I am under orders to join a new division for an unknown destination. We are off to a new bit of the line, probably to be thrown into the breach. It promises to be very exciting. You will understand that for some days I cannot write you fully, but I shall make up for it later. Now for a repetition of Ypres, but with the guns on our side. The weather is not good, but one cannot have everything. 4th of October, 1915. In sending thanks for the parcel of tobacco, which friends had sent for distribution, the writer says, A warm drink and a smoke are really the best dressing we can apply to the men when they come into us. I take the opportunity of a slight lull to tell you something of the great fight still going on. Our part has been a passive one, but we had an important task to do, though it did not take us into the limelight. For several weeks we knew that the offensive was coming, 
and we heard daily the thunder of French artillery in Artois. This gradually got more and more intense, and finally, on the 23rd of September, we got our instructions. We went over the kits carefully, and made every preparation for a rapid march. 24th of September, at 10.30 a.m., we marched with a hundred natives and equipment to a village not far away. I was immediately detailed to go to the advanced dressing station with one officer from the ambulance. It is hard for you to realise the suppressed excitement we all felt. After all these weary months of waiting and of hope deferred, we felt that at last the day was coming for us. We had the men and a big stock of guns and ammunition. After lunch I went out and toured the trenches. We saw all the regimental medical officers and talked over plans for the morrow. There were new communication trenches to be inspected and signboards put up directing wounded to our dressing stations. One felt rather ghoulish or callous in letting the men see all these inevitable preparations. Meanwhile the bombardment grew more and more intense. All the guns were firing rapidly and doing great execution on the German front-line trenches. We were wandering along roads about 700 yards behind and the roar was deafening. Field guns were barking all around us, and above them we could hear the big shells coming over from far back. Aeroplanes were cruising about directing the batteries, but the Hun was too busy to give them much attention. The enemy trenches were enveloped in a mass of smoke, with fragments hurled up every now and then well above the pole. Gunner officers were very pleased with themselves. The Hun reply was very feeble. A few crumps, but mostly pipsqueaks, which did no damage. Away south where the main attack was coming, the noise was continuous. Everything pointed to a good beginning for us. On our way back, up the La Basse Road, a sniper had a couple of shots at us, but his aim was bad. That evening we made our final preparations, and all through the night the guns fired at ten-minute intervals to prevent the enemy from repairing the damage. At 5 a.m. we had all our men in position. Eight natives were stationed at each aid post to direct or carry up cases. Eight others under a lance neck, lance corporal, were stationed in a lime kiln about halfway. They had four-wheeled stretchers to bring cases rapidly to us. In addition, there was a light tramway which passed near us, and stretcher cases could be brought up on the trucks. We had a good service of cars, and about a mile back were horse ambulances, ready for walking cases, with guides all the way up. Thus we were prepared for a rush, no matter how heavy. 25th of September Punctually at 5.45 a.m. the final bombardment began, and hell was let loose. All our guns were concentrated on a half-mile front, and the noise was the worst I have ever heard. The 18-pounders barked as fast as possible, and above them the gurgle of the big shells coming from miles back. A heavy bombardment is a wonderful thing, especially if you are behind it. At Ypres I was the recipient of such attentions and got all I wanted. Now it was our turn to give the Hun a dose of his own medicine. I climbed a tree nearby and watched the show as well as I could. Nothing could be seen of the trenches. They were hidden by a dense cloud of smoke, with the flash of bursting shells lighting them up continuously. The guns then stopped and the attack began. On our front, the Meerut division of the Indian Corps was given the honour of attacking. We were only to advance if they were successful. In any case, the whole attack was to be an elaborate feint to keep the Hun from sending troops down south. We had a couple of surprises for him, and they were now used. First we turned the gas on him, and he did not like it at all. They were not fully prepared for it, and most of their respirators were in trench stores and not easily got at in a hurry. Our next surprise was quite unexpected. Copying naval tactics, we employed smoke to screen our movements. Smoke bombs were thrown from the trenches and went off with a shower of sparks emitting a dense white cloud. This rose to a height of 150 feet and effectively prevented the Hun from seeing our men get out of the trenches and also from what they were doing. Even at this early hour the weather decided, as usual, to go against us. It has been so in every attack we have made. An hour before the attack began, the wind was in our favour, but it suddenly changed and blew from the Hun to us, thus preventing an extensive use of gas. Rain too began to fall. However, off dashed the Meerut division, and we in the dressing station sat and waited for cases. They were not long in coming. A shot from the enemy hit a gas cylinder in our front line, and the escaping gas laid out several of our men. Some came back on stretchers, but the majority walked. One could tell the gas cases at a distance by their gait. The poor fellows staggered along, reeling from side to side, and quite dazed. They could not answer any questions, and just lay down and went to sleep, or gasped for air. 
the results of gas poisoning are not pleasant to look at. Meanwhile the Huns had begun to shell pretty heavily, and the wounded came in freely. About 7 a.m. one of our brigades passed down the road, walking quietly in Indian file to take up their position. They were not shelled. News soon came in that the Meerut division had passed the Huns' first-line trenches and were going on. They went on and on, and in their ardour they exceeded what was planned and broke right through the Hun lines. This was no mean achievement, for the trenches opposite us were supposed to be impregnable. But there were no supports. All available troops were elsewhere. Eventually, by midday, they were back in their own trenches, with many dead and wounded. This action held up large reserves from going south to the real push, and it also showed that the line could be broken here. We only figured in the reports as having demonstrated, but it was a big battle, judged by old standards. During an action, one hears the wildest rumours, generally pessimistic. A wounded man cannot be expected to give the cheeriest or most lucid description of what is happening. He generally tells one that his regiment has been wiped out, or else that they have been driven back. Through the whole of the morning we got all sorts of rumours, principally good ones. We heard that in the front-line trenches of the enemy, many men were lying dead from the gas. Some of the cases looked like poisoning by a certain gas, not our gas. I must not tell the substance yet a while. We heard, too, that there were a good many prisoners. At last a cry was raised, Here come the Huns! And we all rushed out. A corporal of the Black Watch and a pal were proudly marching five Huns along the road. You should have seen the proud air of the conquerors. No one was going to rob them of their spoils. I stopped them and spoke to them. They were all young men, rather small but well-developed, well-fed and well-clothed but they looked dazed and a trifle scared as well they might after that bombardment. The sight of those men, visible proof that we were progressing, was the most powerful stimulus we have had for months. By midday everything was very quiet, and one would not have known that a great fight was on. By three o'clock it began to rain heavily, and further advance was impossible. But we began to get cheery news of our comrades and the French, and that made up for the natural depression we all felt. It is easy for one to sit at home and read of a demonstration being made at a certain point, which held up the enemy's reserves from going elsewhere. However, we were only a microscopic part of the line, and we had only a single line part, not the limelight all the time. It is curious how men are invariably downhearted after a show like this, while the higher command are pleased with the results obtained, as they were in this case. They get a clearer perspective of the whole, of course. An important part in the attack was shared by the RNAS. They had naval ten-pounders right up in the front line. These guns are quick firers, about fifteen shots a minute, and quite as good as the Bosch pipsqueak, a similar gun. The shells could penetrate seven sandbags, so were capable of a considerable amount of damage. We heard with great regret of the death of the medical officer of the Leicesters. He was an old Dublin boy, and I knew him well. When the Leicesters advanced, he went on over the parapet, but was killed by a shell shortly afterwards. While one may doubt the wisdom of what he had done, still he was a brave boy, and had been awarded the military cross ten days previously for a very gallant deed. This night was fairly quiet, except for rifle and artillery fire to prevent the enemy repairing his trenches. As usual, the Hun was up to his customary dirty work, firing on the wounded as they tried to crawl back. He did not use paraffin or incendiary bullets this time, probably because they were not handy. It is this absolute disregard of all rules of fighting which makes us hate the German. Squeals for mercy don't prevent the bayonet being pushed home. But they have only themselves to blame. The Hun has ceased to be regarded as a man. He is simply a beast to be exterminated as quickly as possible, and thus repay doubly all that was done to France and Belgium. Though no advance was made all day, the batteries were busy wire-cutting, with successful results. I spent a good part of the day up a walnut tree, watching the shells bursting on La Basse and Lens. A continual cloud of smoke slowly drifted over those spots, and we could see the flashes of the bursting shells. Prominent on the horizon stood the two gaunt pit heads of Lens, which our men call the Tower Bridge. Up to this, the Hun had not used his artillery to any extent, but in the afternoon he fired all over the place. A crump passed over our tree and landed about a hundred and fifty yards away. I distinctly felt the hot air from it, and did not stay much longer up aloft. The dugout was much more inviting. But it was only a stray shell. Earlier in the day we saw rather an extraordinary sight. A German shell was coming down very near a battery, when it hit the branches of a tree and exploded in mid-air. It was a big shell and gave us a fine firework display. I have referred to a convenient lime kiln, where we had stationed eight Indians under a non-commissioned officer to evacuate cases to us. 
They did good work. When the attack was in progress yesterday, the Germans shelled this area very severely to prevent any advance, and we had the majority of casualties from there. The NCO was an ex-psych groom who had just been promoted. He was down there absolutely alone, but he got a grip of the situation and controlled his post like a veteran. Cases came back quickly and without delay. The lot of them worked on steadily, regardless of the shell fire, and I was very pleased with the way they did what was asked of them. The Indian Kaha, or Dooley Bearer, is one of the surprises of this war, and in a future letter I hope to tell you more about him. But Lance Hake J. C. Ram, though quite new, rose to the occasion, and no one could have done better work. I have recommended him for practical work, done under trying circumstances, and I hope he will get official recognition. These humble men do not get into the limelight, but their work is frequently deserving of more recognition than it gets. We spent the evening very snugly, with a gramophone and a few artillery friends. It helped to make us forget the wet outside. 27th September. The evening had been very quiet. Our guns were on a restricted ration of shell, as there was no object in firing unnecessarily. The day gave promise of improving, but early in the afternoon it was raining as hard as ever. In the morning I was walking along the road by the dressing station when a stray bullet nearly finished me. It just missed my head and shoulders and was about the closest shave I have yet had. Where it came from was a mystery, but it made me take greater interest in my surroundings than I was showing at the time. We were recalled late in the afternoon as active operations had ceased on our front. On the whole we were glad to get back to our own unit. Mixed ambulances only work really well when both lots are equally good. 28th September. The morning was spent in going over our kits and renewing anything necessary. Suddenly we got an order to have two sections ready to join an Indian field ambulance, to form a mixed unit to accompany one of our brigades to another division. This looked more like the real thing, as we knew there were prospects of going down to the big push. We had only a few hours to get ready, and were off once more at 5 p.m. After we reached the rendezvous, we joined up and proceeded down south to a small village, about six miles from here. I was in charge of the transport, and as it was raining hard and a dark night, my job was not an enviable one. Long before we got in, I was wet through, and so were most of the others. When we arrived at the village, we found no billets. This is an old complaint of most of the units. However, we crowded all the Indians in a schoolhouse, and after wandering about, I got a floor to sleep on in a cottage. The people in the village were very kind, and did all they could to help us. A pleasant change from some of the places near here. In the midst of all the worry regarding billets, my water cart backed into a deep ditch, and that did not add to one's pleasant feelings. We were told that our brigade was taking over the line just north of the La Basse Canal, and so relieving a division that had got some hard knocks a few days previously, when demonstrating like the Mirat division. As it was new country, we looked forward to working it. 29th of September. With the O.C. of the ambulance, I motored out to the advance dressing station and took over from the men already there. Then I stayed out on duty. We approached the front along the La Basse Canal, a very picturesque route as far as that bit was concerned, with plenty of green woods. But before the canal, there were the usual small railways and slag heaps and the dreariness associated with all coal mining areas. However, the country was much more undulating, and that was a pleasant change. As one passed along the canal path, straight ahead was seen dead and splintered trees over ruined houses. Without any other sign, that was sufficient to mark where the trenches lay. In the future, dead trees will always remind me of this war. Parallel with the canal ran the railway, and we saw an armoured train with steam up, ready to go forward into action. After going along the canal for about two miles, we came to an open part where we saw a big ruined farm on a small rise. It was the dressing station Lone Farm. In front of us lay a fair-sized village, mostly in ruins. It was Givenchy, the scene of very fierce fighting, especially in December last, for it lies opposite La Basse. We crossed the canal by Westminster Bridge, but I think the LCC maintained better roads than the next one we got on. Lone Farm must have been a big place before the war. It was built in a hollow square, with very high walls. All the sides, except where the living rooms were, had been destroyed by shell fire but there was a good cellar left, and the rooms were very big and handy for our work. I could never see to what use they had been placed in peacetime, for we could not discover where the fireplace was or had been. I was not greatly taken by the height on which we were. The farm stood out too much for my liking. I am a modest man, and I like a ruined cottage which does not attract the Hun's artillery. 
this opinion was strengthened by the fact that shortly after our arrival the hun began to shell the road very accurately finishing up by one at our front door there were some heavy batteries behind us and they were a magnet for most of the shells i was also told that the previous ambulance had done some queer things they flew a union jack on the building until the gunners made them take it down they hung a lantern with the red cross sign outside their gate and also ran motors up and down the roads close behind the trenches newcomers of course and full of book knowledge based on previous wars we old veterans know the hun better but we were paying for the pranks of the others the view from the farm was decidedly prettier than our own at neuve chapelle behind us were woods full of game and birds in front low ridges with the ruins of givenchy and beyond the ridge the hun not on top for once on the other side of the canal we could hear the roar of battle as the struggle went on from haynes and hullock only a short distance away before it got dark i had to wander round and find out the aid posts and the general lie of the land the road went gently uphill for about half a mile and it was well pitted by the morning's hate the houses were all in ruins soon we came to a crossroad windy corner this was a good spot to get the geography of the locality it also had very lively memories for my fellow medico he was here in december and this corner was the centre of cross-fire of two german machine guns lucky was the man who crossed it unhurt to the left the ground gradually sank down to festubert and beyond that was our own area of neuve chapelle the eye saw nothing but dead trees so far as it could see in front of one was a low hill no higher than say musgrave park in south brisbane but judged by the conditions here it seemed a veritable mountain it was honeycombed with communication trenches at one end a jagged pile of bricks represented what was once the church of givenchy and further round were clumps of debris the town hall etc leading down from windy corner to the canal was a road with a large number of miners cottages in quite good condition they enabled the troops in reserve to have a good billet but why they were left intact by the germans was a mystery there was one open space between them which had to be crossed by a communication trench as the road was liable to be under fire at any time the last part of the road was quite open but was shielded by the hill the houses round about the bridge over the canal had suffered very severely they were practically shells on the enemy's side of the bridge a screen had been erected to prevent him seeing anything passing over to quinchy the neighbouring village the enterprising hun had a couple of snipers posted in mud fortresses on both banks of the canal higher up they fire straight down and make things unpleasant for any dawdlers along the canal banks near the bridge was a distillery the most rabid teetotaler could not have smashed it up as completely as the germans have done boilers lie about all over the yards and pipes are twisted into extraordinary shapes and massive pieces of machinery have been tossed about like paperweights it was a very realistic example of the power of heavy shells the soil is sandy and a great contrast to our waterlogged zone having seen the medical officers we walked back everything was quiet save for an occasional bullet singing overhead four aeroplanes passed back from some strafing expedition and we hoped it had been successful this village and the hill have been drenched in british and indian blood fights have raged here since december and they are not over yet la basse has always been the scene of severe fighting and so far has resisted all frontal attacks in this flat country every slight rise is of immense importance and the germans hold the majority of these vantage spots in some very severe fighting in december last the low ridge of givenchy was held by the hun and it took a great deal to displace him in these operations the indian troops took a prominent part and lost heavily the place was eventually captured by the guards here there is a little cemetery and the diversity of regiments bears eloquent witness to the troops who were there since then there have been many more fights notably in may givenchy is like ypres and neuve chapelle one of the classic spots on the western front the evening was rather disturbed by a six-inch gun behind us which persisted in firing every half hour or so i have become so seasoned now that it takes a lot to keep me from sleeping thirtieth of september in the morning i made a two hours tour round the aid posts showing the way to my colleagues it was pretty wet and the communication trenches were ankle deep in many places i enjoyed a fiendish delight in making one fellow with brand new field boots trudge through it all later on i again went out and brought back a poor little gurkha suffering from shell shock he had been standing alone in the front line when a big shell exploded near him apart from covering him with mud it had done no actual damage to him 
but his nerve had gone and there he stood shivering and shaking like a frightened child i have seen many such cases and the recovery is very slow later on i returned to the ambulance and another man took my place in my absence i found that things had been rather rough with them there was still no room for us and the schoolhouse had to serve both for hospital and shelter for our natives under these conditions it was very hard to run a decent show we feel like using explosive language but there's not to reason why first of october the weather is slowly improving but still very cold early in the morning i saw the small church of the village full of troops they had nowhere else to sleep but it was not a pleasant sight especially to a roman catholic the men had hung their muddy clothes and putties on any projecting knob and especially on the altar this incident brought home the hellishness of war very strongly the schoolhouse was also the mary and the mayor was really a young girl we never saw the mayor proper do any work the young lady did everything she was rather a belle and knew it and we had great fun flirting with her tommy atkins gets all the feminine attention that is good for him but in this part of the world the officer does not find much for himself but we got a find at essars and suzanne was kept busy all day exchanging jokes second of october the previous night reminded me of old rotunda days i was on duty and was called up three times for severe cases coming in an aerial torpedo had landed among some of the men and the resulting injuries were rather severe the setting of fractures took me back to the old days at the base hospital in bologna before breakfast we saw fourteen aeroplanes returning from an expedition it was a fine sight and we hoped that they had let off a good deal of hate the hun began to drop heavy stuff into bethuen about two kilometres away and we could hear the explosions distinctly as a means of retaliation grandmother woke up and began to cough fifteen-inch shells into lens the duel soon ceased in the afternoon we were ordered to rejoin our units and soon we were marching back over the same old roads to the same old spot which we first saw last march however it was very interesting to have been in another part of the line our share of the fight has not been a prominent one but we were doing essential work to enable the men south to push on End of section thirteen. Section 14 of War Letters from a Young Queenslander by Robert Marshall Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 12th of October 1915. My turn for leave came quite unexpectedly. This time I was lucky, for I got a motor car drive into Bologna. There were four of us, and we had a merry time. When officers go on leave, they behave like schoolboys. The respite from danger is too good to be celebrated quietly. The road to the base was very fine. We struck several good routes nationales, not paved, but white metal. We passed over very hilly country, and it was a welcome change. Bologna looked the same, full of hospitals and Red Cross workers. The crossing was smooth and uneventful. The precautions regarding submarines appeared to be relaxed, as we showed lights and did not appear to be going at top speed. I had a very interesting talk with a Russian officer and his wife he had been wounded at lublin and he had travelled from petrograd via salonica he was going to the russian embassy at the hague on the whole he was pleased with russia's prospects and said that japanese munitions were coming in freely london was a surprise for it was as dark as a village it was dangerous to try and cross the streets at night in glasgow the writer was struck by the number of women employed at the stations and as car conductors twenty first of october nineteen fifteen i got the grand chance of a day with the fleet on war footing and it was an experience an old college chum is a surgeon in the super dreadnought battle cruiser indefatigable part of the famous squadron of admiral beatty they were at the impregnable base at rossith i shall never forget the sight i got from dalmany station the tall fourth bridge and then the mighty ship after ship extending up beyond grangemouth the launch took us past the lion and the tiger still afloat and fit notwithstanding german reports to the contrary also New Zealand, Princess Royal, and others. The climb aboard by a rope ladder gave the Tars something to smile at. I was distinctly out of my element. The officers gave me a very warm reception, and they were fine chaps. They were thirsting for news, and I was able to give them a lot. As a return, I was shown all over the boat, even to the secret spots, and the twelve-inch guns were loaded for me. That was most interesting by pulling one lever the huge gun was moved into any position by hydraulic pressure by a similar means it was loaded the whole operation being quite automatic 
The best part of the ship was down below waterline in the control chamber. From here the ship could be steered when the bridge was shot away. It was a small room, surrounded with speaking tubes and dials. On one side was the range-finding board for the calculations to be worked out. The hull was a marvel of what mechanical skill can produce. We went down to the men's quarters, where we smelt the warm human odour, and saw burly men in all stages of dress and undress. Above, a band was playing for the men, and games were going on. The fleet is tired of getting so little to do, but they don't expect the Hun will ever come out. But the preparations can never be relaxed, for the enemy is waiting such a chance. They had just returned from an important duty, right under the nose of Germany, and had made a catch of enemy trawlers. The execution of Nurse Cavill has brought home to us what Hun methods are. We can't massacre women and children, but we can avenge ourselves on the men, and we shall. The Hun has set the pace against all civilised rules, and he is going to get as good as he gives. 24th of October, 1915 I have been back three days now, and am settling down to the routine. We had a smooth crossing, but were closely convoyed by a destroyer all the way. It looked as if some U-boat might have been about. The train journey was very cold, and we were pitched out at 5 a.m. I was travelling with a man who had a car waiting for him, and so got quickly back to my unit. We had shifted from where we were to the town with the chateau where we lived in June and July, but alas this time we were not in the chateau. Instead the hospital consisted of a couple of rooms, and with the increased number of cases due to the present bad weather, the space is totally inadequate. One of the functions of an ambulance is to keep back mild cases, and so prevent abnormal wastage from the trenches. This we cannot do, and have to send everybody on. The first touches of winter tend to make everyone very peevish. Today has been the limit, cold and grey and cheerless. Driving rain all the time, and mud ankle deep. Another winter has set in, and well do we know what to expect. God strafe the Hun for letting us in for all this discomfort. Still, our comrades in the Dardanelles are worse off, and we have many comforts they cannot get. Since I have been away, an epidemic of enteric has broken out among the civilians here. I am not at all surprised, considering the insanitary surroundings. We are busily engaged in inoculating as many as will come up. On Sunday afternoon I did a lot of women and children, and got chaffed unmercifully by my colleagues. I took all the kiddies on my knee, and humoured them before sticking in the needle. The majority took it very well. My colleague said that I looked like the old family physician to the ground, and also inquired as to the size of my family, as it was evident I must be a happy father to do the things I did. One mite of four rushed up to me, and when I lifted him up, hugged and kissed me to the huge delight of everybody. However, I have a warm spot for the children, and they reciprocate it. The editor has not deleted this personal cameo picture, because it throws a light on our relations with the people, and is in a pleasing contrast to dark Louvain. From the appearance of things, we are now going to settle down for the winter. I don't think there will be much more activity on the front until the spring, but I hope our men will be in greater comfort this time, and I believe that after November, leave will be given every two months. I hope this is true, for we want frequent changes from this depressing spot. 1st of November, 1915 The writer gives an interesting account of the actions in which the Lahore Division has played a very active part all through the war, but the actual facts cannot be published at present. After paying a high tribute to the Indians, he says, I don't believe the average natives really understand what they are fighting for. They fight because they like it, but it is all in an abstract sense. They have no real enmity against the Hun. This country is depressing enough for white men, but it is more so for natives accustomed to fighting among hills and not lying in a trench for months on end. They cannot understand all this strange subterranean life. Give them a fight in the open and they are satisfied. We have seen at Nerve Chapelle, Ypres, and lately in September how they can fight. There are other influences which count. Native regiments are recruited from definite areas in India, and the caste prejudice comes strongly into play. Their officers had been with them for a long time, and they act as fathers to them more than in a white regiment. They know their officers and will follow them anywhere. But the casualties have been tremendous, especially among the officers, and new ones have taken their place. They are brave men, but the Indian does not take kindly and quickly to a new face. It is so different from a British regiment. There you can slump together remnants from any regiments, and the same old fighting spirit will continue, but you cannot mix Gurkhas and Sikhs, Hindus and Mohammedans. 
there are very persistent rumours that we are to be taken out, and that our destination is where I must not mention. Referring to news just received of the death of an old schoolmate, who displayed great bravery in the trenches of Gallipoli, the writer says, George was a daredevil fellow as a boy, and what he did was just like him. The best fighters here are always men of his stamp. The pity of these brave deeds is that they seldom get recognised. There are too many of them in this war to get individual recognition. But to those who knew the men, the knowledge is sweet. If only the slackers could see the conditions here, they could not remain indifferent. I wish I could show them our men standing already thigh-deep in water, and rain falling every day and mud everywhere. I may not have had much medical work lately, but I have had abundant experience in removing wounded. It is indeed the real post of honour, though one does not feel it. Keep smiling is my motto, and it helps one along. I have the confidence, too, of my natives, and they would follow me anywhere. Some day I may pay the price, but I don't want to skulk behind because of danger. Don't think that I am foolhardy, because I am not, but if duty takes me anywhere, there I must go, and take all risks. You will have a cable from me long before this letter reaches you, foreshadowing some important changes. It is practically certain that the Indian corps are not going to spend the winter here. I am looking forward to a long journey, and then be shorn of all the little luxuries we manage to get here. It is a far cry from here to... <clears throat> but I should soon be able to give you a description of some new scenes, and mails may be very irregular. 3rd of November, 1915 To the average Britisher, the Indian natives come under two or three classes, the wiry Gurkha, the tall bearded Sikh, and possibly the ordinary Punjabi infantryman. But there are many other distinct types. The most popular is undoubtedly the Gurkha. The small man from Nepal comes nearest to Thomas Atkins of all the natives. He is a cheery soul, and enters into all the pursuits of the white man. Caste has little prejudices for him. He will eat meat, especially fowls, and you would be astonished to see how he can drink beer with the thirstiest regular. He plays football well, and is always chumming up with the white soldier. Like most natives, he is musical, and I shall never forget an impromptu concert I heard before a regiment left for the Dardanelles. Half a dozen whistles and a tin can were quite sufficient for a really good selection of waltzes and martial airs. He is handicapped by his small stature and trench warfare. In fact, the parapet had often to be lowered. But he can fight against odds. Last winter one regiment was surprised when practically all their rifles were out of action through having dropped in the mud. They only mustered seventeen rifles in the battalion. But they met the German charge and beat it off with their terrible knives, the kukris. Like most natives, they excel in scouting work, but of that they have had very little so far. Coming from a mountainous country, they are lost on these plains. But officers assure me that no one can touch them in hilly country. While I was with the Highland Light Infantry, I also did duty for some of the Gurkhas, and I was very much surprised at many things. They were very cleanly, and their billets were spotless. The French people prefer them to any other troops, because they are always helpful and clean, and never go thieving. The Gurkha has always had a great reputation. He was practically the guard of India, and inclined to look down on the rest. He has a good deal of reason in this claim. Closely allied to the Gurkha is the Garwal, who comes from the lower-lying parts of Nepal. He is slimmer and slightly taller, but you would probably not notice any difference. Previous to the war, he was looked down on by the Gurkha as a very poor specimen, but he has had his revenge. The bravest fighting of all the campaign has been done by these men, especially at Neuve-Chapelle. They advanced with magnificent élan, and when in a tight corner, pulled themselves out in a manner which has stamped them finally as great fighters. The Gurkha will have to look out for his laurels, and never again can he speak slightingly of his cousin the Garwal. The Sikh is familiar to you. There is no mistaking these magnificent men, tall and broad and black-bearded. They are an elite race, and know it well. In fact, I think that is one of their failings. It is exceedingly difficult to get a Sikh to obey any officer except their own. They have done great work too, and have suffered severely. Many of them are in pioneer regiments, and their record is a good one. They look the most picturesque of all the troops, their turbans with a glimpse of yellow or red ribbon showing at the forehead, the beards carefully rolled up in a net, and their magnificent bodies. They all wear an iron coit, kara, on their turbans. It is one of the five sacred symbols. It represents the coit or disc used long ago as a weapon of offence, or concealed in their long hair, it was good protection from sword cuts. Other marks are the kutch, or short drawers ending above the knee. 
the kunda or small steel dagger, and the kanga or wooden comb worn in the hair. The hair is never cut short like the Gurkha, and it is amusing to watch Sikhs sitting in the sun drying the long locks hanging over their shoulders. The frontier natives, Afridis and Pathans, are a curious cutthroat lot. You can tell them at a glance, small heads and shifty black eyes always watching for a sudden surprise. They live a life of constant vendetta, and they certainly look the part of brigands. They are fighters pure and simple, and like to go where the fighting is thickest. They are very inconstant in their allegiance, and I don't think they mind for whom they fight. Naturally they do not form regiments by themselves, but are diluted by large drafts of more loyal natives. Many of them shave their heads completely, leaving only a greasy curl over each ear, and this style of coiffure does not add to their beauty. While some have deserted and caused them to get a bad name, still they have done some brilliant work. You can understand how the cramped conditions of trench warfare and weather conditions have tired these men to an extent even white troops would feel. They are accustomed to stalk their foes behind boulders, and a warfare of trenches and Jack Johnsons is something strange. The native cavalryman has never had a chance, and we know that they would do well. Their horses are scraggy little beasts more like ponies. Each man owns his horse, and brings it with him when he enlists, and he can ride it too. One longs for the day when the cavalry can show that they are as good as their infantry comrades. The native officers and senior non-commissioned officers are very fine men indeed. With their grey beards they look the part, and they are the most intelligent. Native officers usually buy commissions, and are men of estate in their parts. Very few rise from the ranks. In the cavalry, the native officer usually brings a squadron of men from his village, and this reminds one very strongly of the old feudal system. They are entitled to a salute from white officers, and privates must stand to attention when addressing them. They live in messes by themselves, and they are the most loyal subjects we have. I formed a very high opinion of all of them whom I have met. Their devotion to the white officer is most marked. Last of all come the humble but necessary camp followers, the kishti, or water carrier, with his goat skins full of water, or brass pots carried on a pole like a Chinese gardener, the sweeper and the man who cleans the houses and yards and latrines. I could go on to an unlimited extent on these non-caste men. The caste problem has been a difficult one. The fact that the natives had crossed the water was sufficient to uncast them. When the forces return, I believe they will all have to be recasted by their priests for a consideration. Taking the Hindus who are in the majority, the staple article of food is an oat-cake substance called a chapati, made from atta, or whole flour and water. The flour and water are kneaded together and flattened out by hand, and the cake laid on a flat piece of iron over a fire and browned. This forms the sole ration of the majority of the men. It is eaten alone or with a mixture of spices. When the chapati has had to last more than one day, a certain amount of ghee or butter is added. The ghee is quite white, and is really clarified butter. The Indian is very fond of sugar, and gets a ration of gur, or raw sugar, in a very early stage of refinement. This and water are the simple foodstuffs eaten by the men. The meat-eating natives have goat, and a few will eat beef. Each caste has its own cooks, and they are very particular. The Gurkha is especially fond of fowls, and eats them chopped up fine and made into a stew. There is a great difference, too, in the methods of killing animals. One lot cut off the head with a single blow, others bleed them to death, and each set has separate butchers. I have seen goat refused by men because a drop of blood from some beef had fallen on it. But after all the hardships of this campaign, many of these prejudices are dying out. When the troops came up first, some were told that bully beef was goat, and they ate it freely, but we don't trifle with their beliefs overmuch. The only men I know who enjoy bully are the Bhutias, men from Tibet and quite Mongolian in features. All natives love fruit and milk, especially the Sikhs. The sweeper, or non-caste man, has an advantage over the others, for he can eat the sahib's leavings and does so. On the whole, the Indian is very cleanly in his personal habits, and shows a degree of modesty far beyond the white man. Lately we had an Indian chief with us. He had come out with two motor ambulances, which he had presented to the cause. While abroad, he was given the honorary rank of captain, and he was very proud of it but it was very amusing to watch him going along the streets with an umbrella in hand. The cold was too much for him, and he spent most of the day in his rooms in pyjamas before a roaring fire. While very intelligent, in many ways he displayed a childlike innocence in others. Just like a child, if he saw anything he liked, he wanted to buy it at once. 
when he saw his first aeroplane the desire to get one was strong and he gravely said yes i shall buy a four-seater we got him a few souvenirs and took him down a safe trench and he departed supremely happy i am very much in sympathy with the indians some hard things have been said about them but people do not realize that they have been fighting continuously since christmas nineteen fourteen with no rests and have been in every fight except hill sixty and hooger i cannot give full particulars at present but when the complete history of the war is written it will be shown that they have done magnificently they stood in the breach when our new armies were in the making when they go east to get a rest they will be seen to better advantage with natural conditions more in their favour the aftermath of the war will bring many changes all over the empire and not the least of these in india end of section fourteen section fifteen of war letters from a young queenslander by robert marshall allen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 8th of November, 1915 Still living in an atmosphere of rumour and surmise regarding future destination, all of which is taboo at present. The indications are that we are going far away to a bleak spot. The future is delightfully vague, but we are in for some fighting. All our men want is a good rest, and then we shall be able to face the devil himself. He won't be a hard nut to crack after the Germans the king's accident deprived us of a sight of him apparently there were all sorts of rumours at home that he was really wounded and that the accident was graver than the published report this is not true and the account gave a truthful description of the accident after a terrible week of rain we have had some dry cold days the roads are in a terrible condition and the trenches worse than last winter i had to go through them yesterday to introduce the new ambulance we went ankle-deep in water to commence and then slipped about in mud and deeper water at one point the hun turned a machine-gun on us and we had to lie face down in the mud the bullets came unpleasantly close the parapet had fallen in in many places and if this continues it will mean trouble for the front line thank goodness brother bosch is not much better off in the places where we took his first line he is now in his second which has no fine dugouts opposite one sector the hun has been hurling out abusive epithets at the kaiser and inviting us to come over the only reply was a vigorous bombardment north of us recently two russian soldiers came in i should have liked to have seen our tommy's faces when they surrendered the men had been taken early in the war and were employed repairing the front-line defences this violation of the rules of treatment of the prisoners of war is quite typical of the hun we had the results of a shocking accident today two men were taking a fuse to pieces when it exploded one poor fellow lost both eyes and most of his face was blown away the other lost an eye and a hand and part of his face both should recover but they will be terribly mutilated the writer here indicates that he again had to consider an important question he had been offered a vacancy in a famous regiment with whom he had previous temporary association the officers want me and it is a compliment not often paid my o c does not want me to go i have been shown much consideration and am rather in a quandary i am invited to replace a crack man and that would be a step up the ultimate decision lies with the a d m s and i expect my o c will ask him to keep me on here eleventh of november nineteen fifteen referring to a description of a final leave send-off at a country station in queensland the writer says your remarks regarding the send-off to the men remind me of one of the scenes at victoria station when the leave train returns many of the men are drunk but it is hard to blame them there are a large circle of friends and all make merry in all probability some will never return the poor fellows get little cheer out here since last writing we have moved to a spot about fifteen miles behind the firing line it is the concentration camp preparatory to a long journey it is rather picturesque hilly country and quite a change to the flats round neuve chapelle it must look fine in summer but now most of the trees are bare and leaves are falling fast when going my rounds yesterday i met a company sergeant major who had been through mons and was wounded miss cavell assisted him to escape and he was very full of her praises i read a most amusing story in a french paper lately which contains a great deal of truth the french authorities gave ours a certain number of legion of honour crosses for our officers headquarters called for a list of names and got it but the published list was quite different after discreet inquiries it turned out that two lists had been mixed 
one was that of the officers selected the other gave the names of those inoculated against typhus and the latter got the cross from what i know of the distribution of honours the story is not beyond belief fifteenth of november nineteen fifteen we have had a very bad week of gales and rain and the cross channel service has been completely upset now we have had a couple of dry cold days with heavy frost every night apart from my morning sick parade i have absolutely nothing to do and time hangs rather heavy to pass the time and in view of possible future events i have begun italian and with a bit of hard work i should get some knowledge in a month or two this may come in useful twenty fourth of november nineteen fifteen i have got a few days extra leave and am over here in london enjoying myself now that we are off east we are all getting as much leave as possible after this it will be good-bye to leave until we demobilize in camp in France we are resting and getting back to tropical equipment. Kits have been reduced, especially of winter clothing, and with the cold snap it is difficult to keep warm. We had a smooth channel crossing, and we were convoyed by two airships and a destroyer. 15th of December, 1915. Referring to the preparations before leaving, the writer says, All this waiting about is very wearisome, for we are right tired of everything. I would rather be down at Marseille than hanging around these dirty farms we are in a colliery area and the country is very hilly we have nothing to do all day long and time hangs heavy we expect that the first troops to entrain will leave this week and it is not certain yet whether we will go with them then or later i have to get my thin kit yet but am waiting until we go east it is distinctly humorous to hear that you are sending me a sheepskin jacket my thoughts are more on sun helmets and short pants previous to this i have had a very busy time since i returned from leave the o c and two other officers were away since we left the firing line we have been moving around in a circle and during the shifts i had command of the ambulance when one has to act as leader of the procession and keep an eye on the transport it is no joke we have mules now instead of horses and the drivers know nothing about them and nor do i after my experiences last week i am firmly of the belief that a mule is the most cussed thing living when not biting and kicking he tries to go in every direction except the one you desire good drivers would make a difference but under our delightful system we get ex naval men for instance with no knowledge of horse flesh at all i am learning a trick or two during this war outside of technical work the following is the farewell address to the corps from the king which the prince of wales delivered to representatives from each unit message of his majesty the king emperor to the british and indian troops of the indian army corps in france officers non-commissioned officers and men of the indian army corps more than a year ago i summoned you from india to fight for the safety of my empire and the honour of my pledged word on the battlefields of belgium and france the confidence which i then expressed in your sense of duty your courage and your chivalry you have since then nobly justified i now require your services in another field of action but before you leave france i send my dear and gallant son the prince of wales who has shared with my armies the dangers and hardships of the campaign to thank you in my name for your services and to express to you my satisfaction british and indian comrades in arms yours has been a fellowship in toils and hardships in courage and endurance often against great odds in deeds nobly done in days of ever memorable conflict in a warfare waged under new conditions and in peculiarly trying circumstances you have worthily upheld the honour of the empire and the great traditions of my army in india i have followed your fortunes with the deepest interest and watched your gallant actions with pride and satisfaction i mourn with you the loss of many gallant officers and men let it be your consolation as it was their pride that they freely gave their lives in a just cause for the honour of their sovereign and the safety of my empire they died as gallant soldiers and i shall ever hold their sacrifice in grateful remembrance you leave france with a just pride in honourable deeds already achieved and with my assured confidence that your proved valour and experience will contribute to further victories in the new fields of action to which you go i pray to god to bless and guard you and to bring you back safely when the final victory is won each to his own home there to be welcomed with honour among his own people we have also had a very warm note from field marshal french i believe he has a very high opinion of what we have done we all have nicknames and they are used always one has to keep merry and bright on a show like this there is quite enough gloom without adding to it twelfth of december nineteen fifteen 
Things are jogging along quietly but surely. The weather has been awful, gales and rain every day, and no likelihood of immediate improvement. During the last four days there has been rapid progress in transference of our division. All the troops have gone, and we go in two days. Yesterday I spent a very interesting time at the station watching some units in train. I was there for a purpose because when we move, I am to be in charge of the loading operations. Just another job for me, and further experience as a handyman. The journey will take at least four days instead of twenty-four hours mail train. We will probably have two halts daily to stretch our legs and do some cooking. I may be in an ordinary truck. It will get us used to what is in store for use. Lately, Brother Hun has been dropping fifteen-inch shells in a mining village about four kilometres from here. It is twenty miles behind the firing line, but there is an object in his methods, that is, to destroy a big ammunition depot. So far he has not succeeded. It was cheery news to we old veterans to know that shells were again somewhere near us. Apparently the authorities are going to recognise at last that our native troops deserve some honours for what they have done. Lately we sent in a list of all the men who had done good work. I was glad that my protégé of September 25th, who ran the lime kiln post so well, has his name forwarded. He well deserves all he will get. The RAMC up at the front do a lot of quiet work under very dangerous conditions. They don't get much chance of the limelight. We see most of the sordidness of warfare and little of the beauty, if there is any. But we see the heroism of our men. I shall never forget what I have seen of the devotion of the Indian soldiers to their officers. One has read of it, and I have seen the glitter of their eyes, and their devotion, when an officer meets them or comes in wounded. The Hun doesn't understand how it all can occur. Such feelings between officers and men are beyond him. 13th of December, 1915 We have been delayed over twelve hours, and have just received Brisbane letters of the 31st of October. All night long the roads have been rumbling with the transport going over them, and occasionally the skirl of the pipes. Native regiments are very partial to the bagpipes, especially the hillmen, the Pathans and Afridis. We move out about 8 p.m. Goodbye now to bed for some days. I am hoping to get a stretch out in a closed wagon. Wagon space for eight horses equals 32 to 40 men. You may remember the legend, men 32 to 40, horses 8. Now we are to go through the mill. Referring to letters from Brisbane, the writer says, The unrest at home is reflected in all your letters. We too are very tired of reading the claptrap. Since a certain pressman, who has written glowing accounts, was sent home from the Dardanelles by the censor, he has been trying to get his own back by acting the part of a pessimist. It is poor comfort to the lads out here and elsewhere to read such tosh. I believe the front-line trenches on both sides, especially around Ypres, are in a shocking condition. They are non-existent in many places, the parapets having subsided. There have been abnormal rains in a normally waterlogged country, and the result is awful. Rats have become a terrible plague, and something will have to be done soon. We know something of the conditions, and the men have our warmest sympathy. It will be good to get to a dry, sandy soil again. End of section 15 End of War Letters from a Young Queenslander By Dr. Robert Marshall Allen Read for LibriVox by Dr. Beth Thomas For the Centenary of the Gallipoli Campaign April 2015 Lest We Forget